okay, fairly, fairly small room. Um, great, good morning everyone and welcome to the uh, Net Zero Community Forum here at Nottingham with Western Power Distribution. Uh, my name is Kai Hall, I'm a project manager at Regen, helping to lead our community and local energy programme. Um, before we get started, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, so the toilets are just out this door and to the left, um, as you can see when you walk in. And in terms of fire alarms, we're not, I'm told we're not expecting any fire alarms, but the engineer is working on a fire alarm, so it may go off at some point this morning. Um, if it just goes off for a short time, you don't need to worry about it, but if people from the venue come in and get us, then we will need to go out on the fire exit here or here. Um, so that's, that's all covered. Uh, Wi-Fi is also there as well, or on that yellow sheet just over there, if anyone wants to get out that as well. Um, so yeah, it's great, great that there's so many people joining us today, we're really excited to be back doing these in-person community energy events and it's really fantastic to hear all the, the networking you've all been able to do this morning already. Um, so yeah, we're really keen for these, these in-person sessions and a chance for you to have the conversations that you need to have and uh, network and meet, meet the people that you, that you want to meet. Um, so yeah, for, for any of you that aren't aware, um, Regen, we're a not-for-profit centre of renewable energy expertise. We're based down in Exeter in the southwest. Um, and for about 10 years now, we've been running a programme of community energy support. And for much of that time, we've been working with, with Western Power Distribution on, on, on programmes to help community energy projects connect to their network, to do more innovation projects, to access funding, to do innovation projects with them, like flexibility as well. Um, so yeah, and now we're, we're really pleased that they point are faithful to the, to the role as a dedicated community energy engineer. So it's really good that they're refreshing their, their support for community energy in that way. Faithful's going to talk a little bit about that this morning as, as well. So if, if anyone wants anything from WPT, Faithful is the man to get to get to. Get to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, he'll, he'll, give you his, he'll give you his contact details later, so feel, feel free to have him on that. Um, I'll just run through our, through our agenda this morning. So we've got, got a really, really happy session, um, ending with lunch, so everyone, everyone stays till the end. So that, that's the title. <laughs> so lunch, which you don't get on Zoom calls, obviously. Um, so yeah, as I said, Faithful's going to just run through um, some of WPT support for community energy and a bit of an intro to WPT for anyone who's, who's not aware and a bit of an overview of the sector as well. And uh, then we're really pleased to be joined by Miranda from Nottingham Energy Partnership, who's going to talk about their really wide ranging um, local energy projects and how they are, how they work with local authorities, the different types of projects on energy efficiency, generation, solar uh, that they're doing. So, yeah, really great to hear from, from Miranda. Um, and then we've got our breakout sessions. So, when, when you all signed up for the, the event today, we asked which, which topics you'd most like to discuss. These were the two that were the most most popular. So we're going to, going to split you all into two breakout groups um, and, and go through those 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 topics. And um, we've got our sort of we've got Faithful, who's going to and all the people from WPD who are going to lead that that um, conversation on innovation and help develop some of those project ideas. And we'll shortly be joined by Dave from Share Energy, who's going to talk a bit about um, some of their community energy business models and support the, the newer groups in the session uh, that want to talk about that. So yeah, that, that's really the the opportunity for all of you to ask the questions uh, that you want to ask, get those answers, um, and uh, yeah, discuss, discuss things with each other. Uh, then we'll have a quick tea break, uh, more chance for networking, um, and then Shannon from Community Energy England is going to talk about the, the busy time of year that we're in now, which is Community Energy Fortnight, and all the activities that are going on around that, and excitingly the newly launched Community Energy State of the Sector Report, which gives an overview of community energy across the UK. Um, then, as mentioned, so Dave, Share Energy is going to join us, talk about a bit about their post speed and tariff community energy, sort of business models that they're making work in the current uh, climate. Then Mark is going to talk about a bit about the grid, about how, what the network is, is like, WPT, um, how that might change in the future, and we'll have what the green recovery scheme is, and how that's, that's changing things um, in East Midlands in particular. Then it's a chance for you to ask questions to, to the WPD team, to Faithful Mark, uh, Paul and Ellie as well, um, and Kyle. I don't know someone. <laughs> um, and then, and then, yeah. We're, and then at the end, we're really keen for you to give us give us your feedback because these these sessions are always shaped by what all of you tell us that you want to hear about. So please do give us give us your feedback on that. Um, and then, as I said, we're, we're enticing everyone to stay till the end with a with free lunch, um, which has been arranged by Prina. It tells me it's going to be very nice. So yeah, we've got that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and. 
And yeah, I'm sure at that point everyone would want to go out and enjoy the sunshine, but there's, there's no rush to, to leave at one o'clock. We encourage everyone to, to stick around for, for a little bit of a chat. Um, so yeah, really, really pleased to be putting on this, this session this morning. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, and I will now hand over to Faithful. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Afet Zander. Uh, I'm a community energy therapist here, working for the Parliament's Commission. Uh, before I start, just to sense check, does everyone know what West Parliament's Commission does or who they are? Okay, so they do it by village, but that's how <laughs> 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 they bring me up with the dance past when they go off, but they're good at that, but actually, part of that, no, I don't. Right. To me, it means either we've done something right or there's something wrong with that. <laughs> that's a subject for another day. So, um, my that's my agenda for today. I'll talk about who we are and what we do, so that will cover your question. And then I'll talk about what I try, what, how our company is evolving from how it was yesterday to where we went to go. Then I'll also talk a little bit um, on how you can work with the grid or what we are trying to do as a way of working with community energy. And also, of course, how cover some details on community energy itself, and at the end, we'll see the details of how you can get in touch with me. Excuse me. Do you have copies of your slides? So we'll be sending out slides for everyone after, after the event, so yeah. We'll so we'll get them to take it Do you want to do straight notes, then? No, no, not everything's on the slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, who we are. So Western, Western Power Distribution, is the local distribution network operator. When I say local, we cover the all of East and West Midlands, South Wales and Southwest England. So that's all the way from Red Roof to Lincoln on that map there. Our network covers a, a lot of cables and overhead lines, poles, transformers, and towers. Now, the diagram down there is just, the picture down there is just giving you a snippet of how the electricity industry is set up, just in case, I don't want to assume that everyone knows. So power generally starts by someone producing it, which is a generator, and then that has to get to where we are. So in between you've got transmission and you also have distribution. And then, of course, there's the supply of the region. So, in terms of what we do, we maintain uh, the main focus of what WP does is to keep the lights on. And to do that, we obviously have to maintain the equipment that, that gives us the power. And then, if, it, if the network breaks down, we've got to fix the network. And then we have to connect customers, old and new as well as upgrading them. And then, because we know that the electricity system is changing, we need to operate our system in a way that is a bit smarter. And so, if you think about the way the power system was set up years ago, power was coming from a generator all the way to where we are. There was nothing in between. So what has happened now is, because we are promoting the net zero agenda, we have got wind farm, we've got solar, 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 solar plants everywhere. And so that has, that has inevitably changed the way we have to manage our system because now power is flowing both ways to and from. Mm. So if you look at my, my, my diagram on the right-hand side there, uh, In a traditional sense, in a, tra in a traditional effect sense, we've got infrastructure that is already installed. Now, because infrastructure can only cope in terms of how much it is sized for, 
it means that we have to operate in our system in a way that we should cater for that extra demand on our system. So if you think that the green line there is giving you a static, a static level of how much we can cope with, and then suddenly at 12 p.m., at 12 noon or 6 late, the demand goes up, it means that you're going to breach that line. Now, there are two things, there are a few things you can do. One is by removing all the cables and put new ones. Remove all the transformers, put new ones. But if you think about it, our pockets are not as long as... So somehow we need to think about other ways of managing this. So what I'm saying is acknowledging the fact that the demand on the system will, will fluctuate, it means that we have to install, uh, we have to, we have to install equipment, is, we, have to, we have to maintain our equipment in such a way that we should be able to cater for that fluctuation. So to do that then, we have what we call active network management. So that is basically saying, if, there's, if, if our network is overwhelmed, then we must be able to ask some customers either to come off or to come on. So that is called active network management. So in short, what I'm saying is a DSO, that's the direction we are going, operates in such a way that they have to interact with the system in a clever way in order to manage that. So okay. that's what. Could you just say whether the active network management, if you're encouraging the users to cut down at critical times, what are the incentives? Is it financial? Do you have any kind of legal, legalistic power to do that? Yeah, so active network management operates in this way. So when you've been given a, an offer to connect to a system, it will stay, it will stay in there to say, when we are breaching our system, we will probably ask you to either go off completely or your output will be reduced. So that is one of the that is one of the conditions of your offer. Which, contract. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Which you either have to accept or you don't accept. <clears throat> so a few challenges then as a result of the lockup on the future. The WPD will need to be able to accommodate all the various forms of low carbon technologies that are coming on the system, either local generation, which is either solar, solar PV, wind, um, it's your thermal or battery. And in these days, obviously, there's an encouragement for all of us to use electric vehicles as well as heat pumps. Our networks were not designed to be able to cope with such huge volumes of connections as it were. And then one of the things you notice is that when people are putting in their applications with WP, nobody is on the same part of the network. And then ultimately reinforcement will be one way of dealing with that. And then normally reinforcement takes a long time. So one of the things I suppose which when I've gone to various forums, people have said, but why don't you just keep on upgrading the system? No, the answer is no, because if you think about it, we end up with the situation where we're going to chuck a lot of money, but then end up with uh, what am I constructed assets, which ultimately impacts on your view as well. Now, the diagram on the right hand side there um, is basically saying when you've made an application for that repeat for a generation connection or a demand connection, whatever it is. Ultimately, we need to ensure that by connecting you, we are not breaching our system. So if you think about it, I've got a system in there with three circuits. What I want to be sure of is if I lost that one there, the remaining two should be able to, to handle your demand. I don't want to be left with a situation whereby I lose that one, and then this one also goes, and then everything goes on plan. So what I'm saying is, according to our design criteria, we must always make sure that our system remains uh, intact, secure, and then 
Uh, those are some of the things we look for. So, new technologies then. In 2019, our government was committed to achieving net zero by 2050. So, WPD, local authorities, and others are working very hard to make sure that we reduce the carbon footprint. So, that could be through decarbonization of heat as well as transport. And then, because <laughs> of that, Western Power Distribution is trying to promote community energy groups, of which most of you belong to. So, net zero basically means there's so much carbon dioxide coming out, which you can offset by doing all sorts of things. So, as I said, WPD is really committed to accelerate that across our communities. So, what is community energy then? So, local, local communities taking collective action to address the climate change and local ownership, as well as economic benefits of energy. So, that can be done in many ways. Energy saving device, uh, advice, fuel poverty action, of which some of you belong to, community owned renewables. And then within your communities, you can look at models that you can use to use your locally generated um, uh, electricity. And then you can actually export it if you have excess of it. And then energy efficiency schemes, community flexibility, demand reduction. I think that's what the gentleman was asking there. That's one of them. And then Obviously, community energy groups, as we know them, are trusted local advocates. Uh, of course, the core idea is to reduce carbon and tackle fuel poverty at the local ownership, at the local level, by owning assets and also enjoying all the benefits. So just an overview then. So it's not just this conference, just, it's not just this conference, not, it is not just this community energy group here that is very supportive of promoting the net zero agenda. I've been to Como and spoken to others like yourselves, and then you can see that really is taking off. So WPD is working with Rayton, that's my colleague there, to deliver the net zero communities program to support the ambitions that you have in all our license areas. We've been working with Rayton for a good part of eight years now. And in this time, we have done events, innovation projects, and we've produced a lot of material. I think some of you probably should have seen a community magazine last week or the other week. Uh, that's part of that uh, initiative. And then, obviously, there's new wave of communities, small businesses, and local authorities who want to connect uh, low carbon technologies. And WPT is got a crucial role in facilitating that transition. So what support then is available to community groups like uh, yourselves? So we provide more accessible information on network connection. What are the associated reinforcement costs? And you can find that information either through our website, Cesaris, or uh, newsletters, and so on. Then. The last little point there about open LV is you can find information about what is connected to a distribution substation or even a primary substation through a platform called Open LV. We can chat about that later if you are interested to know about that one. And then because we know that our network as well as the 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 issue of climate change is accelerating. We have to work with Ofgem to look at what investment is needed. And so we look at options for supporting new flexible connections for renewables and then it's storage solutions. That can be through things like demand side flexibility, energy storage. And then as I said at the beginning, we develop solutions for transmission as well as distribution to maximize the use of existing network. And then we also look at what are the development opportunities and then what funding is required for some areas of innovation. Towards the end, I'll share with you one project. Okay, can I just ask you on this? I know 
after we've been quite critical uh, about the level of the WPG investments in uh, strengthening and transforming local energy grid yeah. systems on a community basis. I'm just wondering what incentives there are or what, what benchmarks you've set for projects that deliver either significant measurable reductions in demand, um, which you can find examples of in parts of the United States where that becomes a duty to be Or, you know, in, in the, the other capacity will be generally where you've got something now in excess of 2,000 local decentralized grid systems, yeah. where those interactions allow you to be both a supplier uh, and a consumer in your local grid to real community financial gain. Can you, can you just tell us where you are in that route map towards that radical decentralization that we're going to need to hit the net zero targets? So, as I said, Western power distribution is really keen to understand the impact of local energy of, of energy on the communities. And so through various platforms like this one and others, obviously, as well as stakeholder engagement, of which my friend here is a member, we try to understand where WPT can help you either in facilitating your connections, because sometimes what we find is most people don't know where to go to if they, for example, they wanted to make an application to us. So as I suppose the point I'm making is WPD's role is really to try and help communities as well as individuals in achieving that goal. Yeah, the reason I ask that is because we're not just in Nottingham, and not far from here, about five to walk is the Meadows. Yeah, yeah. there's a number of people here from the community energy committee that knows us there. It's been in existence for about 12 years. Yeah. And, and we really struggled to get WPD support and engagement. In, trans in moving from a very substantial level of solar roofs that have been put up to, into the next step of developing a little grid. And so, if we're going to hit those next up, actually, we, we need to see practical engagement on the ground that would allow you know, areas like the Meadows and you know, hundreds of others to actually deliver. Pre based, up and ready, whatever you're going to call them, you know, models for you know, decentralized grid systems. Because so, you when, you say, to, when you say you haven't had support from WPP, is it because you haven't spoken to us or you're spoken to us? No, we've been speaking to you for years right. and uh, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> never get any further than that and these presentations. So, so you know, it's whether we need to. You know, if you, if you tell us we need other partners, we, we need to go to Octopus because they're a sort of game-changing energy yeah. company. Well, we can do that, but, you know, it, what, what confuses me is this experience that in, in Germany, those 2,000 decentralized local energy grids all work with the local, their own local distributor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and those doesn't work in time. I don't understand why it's so difficult here to make that big leap into the local generation, local sharing, local policy. I think, in a sense, you guys have all the skills. Yeah. And the communities have tons of enthusiasm to go mm -hmm. down that path, but it's actually getting into the game. Yeah. Thanks. Do you want to come on? Yeah, I'm Dave Green from Share Energy Faithful. I have to say that WP do a great job in terms of your capacity map. It's really useful. I work with other DNOs, and yours is probably the best. Um, in terms of putting in a, a request for information, get a good response, good dialogue. The problem comes at the end of that dialogue, the answer is almost always no. <laughs> and um, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, we work, I was working in Worcestershire. And we were told we couldn't even put, we could put like, you know, five kilowatts of AV on a building, and, and the answer would probably be yes. If we wanted to put 50 kilowatts yeah. on, the answer would probably be no. Yeah, yeah. 
And we'd say, even if the building was using most of what we generate, and the answer came back, oh yes, but we've we've allowed for the consumption of that building within our within our calculations for for the local network. So you're you're not even you know there's not even the possibility of reducing energy demand by using electricity directly. The answer would probably be no, yeah. because. I mean, all, I mean, there is a specific problem there. It's in that there is an awful lot of PV already in Worcestershire. Yeah. yeah. Go to Derbyshire, and we've got a project for a heat network that I'm going to be talking about later. And we went to WPD and said, we, we want to put up a one megawatt wind turbine to, uh, to power this heat network. And the carbon savings are enormous. Um, I mean, there were planning issues, but that's all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the answer we got back was uh, no, um, not for a minimum of five years, because uh, not not because of capacity issues there, but because of fault issues. There yeah. are there is there is a problem with faults in that area, yeah. and and anything that we generate, even if we don't not export it, even if we said we will never export to that site. We wouldn't get permission to put up that on megawatt wind turbine. So this is great. Your, your service up to that point is I can't fault it. Yeah. But if the answer is always no, what's the point? I'm afraid. Yeah. And when's that going to change? All I can say is I'm ticked off on our way. Can I just say that for, for small groups that have got started, when we look at something like in our situation in high school green for a field of great water, we were looking to we'll wait to see what the meadows proposes to achieve and we'll follow there. And so the, the brick wall they hit affects much more than just them, and I'm sure the same is true in Derbyshire. Yeah. That, you know, if you hit a brick wall, you go. Well, where are we going? I totally understand why you end up being central value and demonstrating instead of actually trying to change energy yeah, yeah. policy because it is that brick wall. So. I think it's probably worth saying as well, just on the connections point, I think things of gem rules are changing from April next year. So in terms of connecting those things like that. Yeah. 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 And I think we can pick up some of these conversations in the breakout sessions as well. We do have time to do that. I'm conscious that we're we going to remote time. Just kind of back on the table. Can't remote. 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 Can't Looking at the option stuff, which I mentioned, and we put in a business plan at the moment. So there's, there's a lot of things that are changing. Good. Yes. And um, I, I don't want to turn up and say it's all jam tomorrow, but um, we've got a business plan on the table at the moment that if it is passed by option, it means that from April of next year, if we're not spending a million pounds a week just on the local networks in the local streets, we're not going quick enough. And it also includes that level of investment at other policy levels. Um, and also, often are changing the rules so that you don't end up paying for reinforcements. If you're a demand customer, you only pay for reinforcements at your voltage level if you're a generation customer, which means all the, all the answers of no become an answer of yes, because the cost gets spread amongst your customers. There's another idea, but you will probably be for that. But leave that aside. Of general changing the rules to allow us to build a network which really connected. So yeah. it's, it, it's an exciting time to see the change that's coming out of the, the next price of Trump. Yeah. Can, can, sorry. Yeah, can it wait to no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> just want to pick up and break yes. up. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. We can talk later if you want. So, so yeah. what other support is available? So, <laughs> so, so going forward, uh, because of the concerns of race and with the, with the realization that quite probably we should have been dealing with fuel on a very close range, the rapid is making a decision that all being equal by the end of, by 
April of next year, you are going to have a dedicated community and independent engineer in each license area. So East Midlands will have its own, West Midlands, South Wales, and Southwest. So obviously they will help you with the support and the expertise that you need to meet your energy, your energy uh, local needs. And then going forward, obviously, as, as, as of today, we'll still be holding a lot of in-person as well as other forums for stakeholders. We'll publish resources as we do it now, which you can see online or maybe emails to you and so on. And then some of you might know that Western Power Distribution has got an annual one million pounds community funds fund matters fund to help support communities across our four license areas. And then where are we now? So some of you have seen um, <clears throat> have seen a, a community energy strategy document that was published sometime in February. And then back in March, we did an online Zoom session, which was rated eight out of 10. And as a result of that, I still get a lot of queries on all sorts of things, such as what we are discussing here. And then because we understand that we might not be able to have such events all the time. So we are also looking at producing uh, YouTube videos, <clears throat> which you will be able to access. And then we'll be producing a community energy newsletter every quarter. And then, of course, we'll continue doing dissemination and, conf and conferences such as, such as this one. Now, some of you could have heard of the state of the sector report for community energy. So the latest one was published, I think, this week. So in there, it gives you an overview of how community energy across England and Wales as, as, as developed, particularly for 2021. So I won't go through all of them, but the point, one point I'd like you to know is, for example, 18 community organizations were set up just in 2021. And then in the course of 2021, 7.5 megawatts of new renewable electricity generation was, was added to the system. So Notwithstanding the concerns of race, there's still something going on, but I wish that we could be a bit more than that. So the transition to net zero is going to affect everyone. And community energy is quite key in achieving net zero. And then if you look at the graphs here, you'll see that probably the biggest area for local community energy groups is probably electricity generation, which you can see here, it's been fairly uh, ever present. So within WPD itself, we have about 99 community energy groups. So that's, I think that's a decent uh, figure. So in 2021, the total number of generation that was com com community laid was about 331 megawatts. So there's quite a lot that community communities can contribute to achieving the net zero ambition. I'm just whizzing through this because I think Shannon is probably going to cover some of them. I didn't know she was doing something like this. So, uh, so in terms of innovation, what is the WPD doing? So we have a few energy, we have a few innovation streams that we use. One is called network innovation allowance. So network innovation allowance means that you come up with an idea to say, I want to do the following, and then Western Power Distribution will release some money to do that. So that is called network innovation funding. So WPD will do that. Then there is a bigger one, which is called Network Innovation Competition, which if you look there, you probably see that it will be superseded from next year by a new innovation stream called Strategic Innovation Funding. So Network Innovation Competition means that you come up with an idea, 
then you go and compete with others. And then through that competition process, your project gets selected. So as I've said, uh, it will be replaced by the other one uh, next year. So in terms of this year, it's not going to happen. So, <laughs> so I want to give you an, an example of a community energy innovation project that Western Powers District is doing. And this one is based in Como. It is called Venice. So this was developed through the lockdown period. So it is looking at what is the, what's, what's been the impact of the pandemic on energy consumption. Can smart meter data be used to predict consumer vulnerability? And then is it possible that through such a scheme, you can engage the fuel poor to achieve net zero? So uh, it is, I suppose, our biggest or our largest consumer customer vulnerability project. And I suppose from what I recall, it's probably the first, the first one. So as I've said, it is going to understand what are the characteristics for a vulnerable customer? What pandemic persistence current assessment is required? And then to engage with the local community within Como in a place called Webbridge, uh, which you can see over there. And then through that project, we'll try to test all kinds of business models and also use the benefits of smart matter, smart, smart data. So just to finish off then, uh, one of the points has already been raised. So there are particular challenges with community-led distributed generation because you compete with many, with other people, including large-scale community, large-scale developers. And then as I said earlier, we use other mechanisms to try and offer a connection uh, of which Active network management is one of them. Then community energy projects obviously impact on the grid and reduce the need for enforcement. And then net zero, the drive to net zero is probably one of the biggest challenges as we go towards 1950. And then we are frankly are working very hard to make sure that where this, where it is possible, we can offer you uh, capacity. Uh, mm -hmm. For you to go ahead and make your uh, your connection possible, and uh, that's how you can get with Africa. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think any questions are painful because we are running slightly over time. We'll have to just wait for the the breakout sessions and also our our previous ones there. But yeah, you can get in touch with Faithful. Uh, there's details there. He's made it very clear he's prepared to go all the way down to Cornwall to meet the community energy groups there. So we, if, you, if any of you have got community <laughs> events going on and you want to walk into WPT there, you can get in touch with Faithful. Um, but now I will hand over to Miranda from Nottingham Energy Partnership. We're going to talk about some of their really exciting projects. It's really nice to be here, actually. This is the first one I've done in two years. <laughs> and uh, I thought it's about to say, oh my goodness, it's just so different meeting people and speaking in front of an audience. But anyway, so um, my name is Miranda Cumberbatch, and I'm from the Charity Loss Energy Partnership. And, um, and that's the title of my slides, and focus on community energy, fuel quality, and working with local authorities. And, um, and I'm the acting CEO at MEP just recently. And leaving that job. And, uh, and I think what's different, um, or the presentation today, what you'll see is a walkthrough of our approach to um, community energy and really realizing that one, it's a one size doesn't fit all. And it's what you'll see is that we often want communities will come to us, communities will come to us. But importantly, um, we also help create community um, groups. Um, in some of the projects that we deliver. And sometimes we're the voice of the community groups because I think as Faith will say, you know, come and talk to us. But often community groups are a bit apprehensive about doing that. So uh, we often help in that way. So um, 
Oh, don't worry about any pain, I don't care too much. I'll really get into the projects. It's three different projects um, that we're going to that we're going to look at today, and it's just a small focus on a, a look at some of our future work. So uh, Lost Energy Partnership, we're an independent um, charity and we've been driving the climate change agenda for <clears throat> more than 20 years now. Um, and also with that, very much focused on tackling real poverty. And that's been our message from the very, very beginning. And yeah, there's been ups and downs. You know, some people listen, some people do not, but we kept going. Um, so our focus has always been climate change. And with that, obviously cutting carbon emissions to reduce real poverty. For those people who are low incomes and struggling and often don't respond to the headline, headline news. Um, and they don't understand about net zero. So, and this is another thing. So what we're doing at the time is trying to also um, make sure we get the messages to the uh, public so they understand the terminology. Um, and what we want to do is make sure that we bring warmth and comfort. So we're trying to retrofit homes, installing those key insulation measures, also heating improvements, so that they can enjoy that warmth, that comfort. In the work that we do, that you'll see through some of the projects, there's a huge focus on area-based schemes. Area-based schemes means that we can transform communities. And so it's not just what a, a pepper potting, Approach, but making sure that when we can, we can get streets, um, streets and homes, or um, whole streets with improvements in there. And um, important is the uh, raising consumer interest in the um, energy market. So you'll see throughout this as well that it's really important that the education is there as well. And so um, in some of the projects we'll look at this bit later, I'll go through that in more detail. Another important point is local employment. Uh, we've done schemes where we can, often constrained by um, government policy, but we've trained local installers. Um, we found and we, we want to make sure that you know, we can um, increase the local economy. And so we've had training for contractors. We have a short supply of contractors when it comes to retrofitting homes. And it's, it was wonderful in the days when we were able to train contractors to install um, solid wood insulation. You can do it myself, but don't ask me to do it for you. Okay, that good. <laughs> but it was great. So we were able to take them out and, uh, and off they went and um, learned how to do both install, but then they had that practical application of being able to work on a program for a couple of years installing and coming and uh, <coughs> experience that. So what we do. Um, so Often we, so with all the policies that come out, we make sure that we understand the body so that we can implement them and that we can bring them to communities and explain in very simple terms what's on offer. Um, we lead and work with key stakeholders, so your local authorities, we work with energy companies, and we work with various uh, voluntary organisations as well. And this is to develop and deliver retrofit programmes for the domestic sector. And we also, as I said, you know, we're very keen about getting messages across. So there's, it's important to put material together um, that is easy to understand um, for the public about um, energy efficiency, including how they can alleviate fuel quality um, through the install of various home energy improvements. And we provide independent information, of course, and we work directly with the communities. So here, I've just given. This really just shows some of the work that we've been doing. So these are past projects, and um, you know we've been running for more than twenty years, as I said. And what you have here is a range of different projects, a range of different policies. Cert, CES, um, Eco, one, two, three, four, um, Green Deal for Communities, Wall Homes Fund. But this is um, uh, funded straight from central government, but also from other streets as well. And these are just some of the really big projects. Um, that we've delivered, and this is where, where we can, we try to, um, we've always focused on fabric first, getting the home insulated, but also um, where we can, um, taking that whole house approach to retrofitting the home. And, um, 
And as you can see, so just with those projects, there's other ones as well, we've delivered um, almost 20,000 or installed almost 20,000 measures um, over the years. And in terms of funding, that's over 25 million pounds worth of funding that we've gone down. <coughs> but what we're doing now, so we have our longest running project, Healthy Housing Service. And with that, we um, have East Wings Affordable Home Campaign. Um, that's one of our projects, actually, quite well as to distribution. Um, and over the years, we've supported more than 11,500 um, households. Um, we've also got our power up. And with sorry, the Healthy Housing Service, we install a range of energy saving measures. We also make sure we do those additional services, um, such as uh, to increase people's health um, and well being. And so that will be making sure they make their applications for home discounts, um, savings from uh, seven trends, for instance, there's discounts on the water bill, various others, as well as benefit applications. Power Up Health <coughs> is another project um, that we have running. Um, this is an exciting one because it's the focus on health, as it says in the title. But when we first started with the Healthy Housing Service, we always used to, well, we still do, the aim was to trade frontline staff. Trained frontline staff who are nurses, um, social workers, um, who go into people's homes and let them know about the project, about your poverty and the services that we're able to deliver. And Power Up Health picks up on that. <coughs> and so we go across um, East Midlands and listen uh, to organisations know uh, we're in hospitals, every Derby Hospital, for instance, not the first hospital, um, every two weeks. And doing presentations to um, those people who have uh, respiratory problems. And um, so they come in and they have various um, cardio sessions, surprisingly, but they do. And um, we actually deliver workshops to them to let them know about the services that are available. Um, and that's been successfully running for the last four years. And then we have our NEP boiler repair and placement scheme. And this is delivered from a range of uh, funding from different um, charities. But I think the point is that um, with all our projects, um, or the way we work, there's a need to look far and wide in terms of getting funding in, um, not just straight from the government, we're looking to see what other opportunities there are in terms of us trying to bring innovation to the work that we do. Looking at the gaps in terms of government policies to see if we can fill those with other funding um, and deliver a comprehensive program. And as I said, we can't do it on our own. Um, so um, NEP has always worked with public health. Public health being um, uh, both at, in Nottinghamshire and Nottingham City, for instance. Um, also working with GPs, we have a GP project work, uh, running at the moment, where we receive the growls directly from GPs. Um, whilst we've been training frontline staff GP, for 20 years, we never get referrals from GPs. We always get them from, <coughs> it could be from, uh, I don't know, Fire, fire, uh, fire service, police service, social workers, but never GPs. But we have a an exclusive project working with a GP in Mansfield. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done uh, in the background regarding the connectivity for the cohorts, and they send referrals through to us. Um, of course, we work with local authorities, we always have done, and this is really important to have local authority endorsement for all of our projects, it makes life a lot easier because. And I think even probably even more so now uh, because of technology, people are worried about is it a trusted source? Is this real? Is this project real? Um, and then we work for a range of charities in Age UK, March's Energy Agency, um, along with others. Um, and of course, we work with the energy companies because a lot of the funding comes down by the energy So that's just a kind of quick snapshot. Uh, um, in terms of uh, what we do at NEP, and I'm happy to take questions uh, later. We're going to look at our first project. So this is probably more conventional community energy project, um, and this is our solar farm. So we have, uh, it was the first, uh, first county community energy scheme, and uh, we have a five megawatt, not to mention punch, has a five megawatt community owned Grandma's solar farm array and solar array, sorry, and um, it's in Lander Lane in Colston Bassett. 
we're talking 20,000 um, solar panels on this site. Um, and, uh, and of course, it's an ethical investment in clean energy, and it was constructed in 2016. Um, it was a lot of work to get it off the ground. Oh my goodness. Um, and, um, but we had um, at the time a uh, managing, we had a managing agent, which was Mongoose, who helps us to get it uh, actually all chipped. Um, but our first, we had our first share of the um, where we achieved 876,000 pounds of community investment. Um, and this includes investment from uh, NEP. So we invested in it really to get it uh, to help invigorate um, this offer and uh, with the idea that we would be um, paying back as a short term um, investment and it would be paid back in, after the first year. Um, the shares were valued at 10 pounds each. And we accepted investments um, between five hundred pounds and hundred thousand pounds, and uh, the interest rate is a uh, five percent interest rate. Um, I can remember actually um, the share offer. So that was we actually went out. I think we joined by our managing director, and we went out with our leaflets put them through the door. We had a very short window in order to deliver this, and um, put them through doors in different areas, uh, getting people to gets people's interest and trying to make sure that they invested. But it, it managed to turn it around very, very quickly. Um, and we're pleased to say we have this uh, wonderful solar farm. Um, in terms of performance, um, it's performed really, really well, um, as predicted, um, over the last six years. Um, so it generates enough renewable electricity to the equipment to 1,250. Um, and when it comes to carbon dioxide savings, I actually did work this out, so it's uh, close to 2,000 tonnes. Um, and you can see um, savings generation there. And, um, and the wonderful thing about it is that we have uh, the surplus funding, and we do are able to help community projects as well, um, which we'll have a look at in a moment. Now, it's fortunate that we have, uh, of course we need to, we have uh, regular reports in terms of the generation. So you can see that it's performed as well. Um, that's easy to finish. So what we're seeing here is the orange one for the actual, and the yellow is the forecast. So it's very, very close. And I think we are actually at 120 percent So of course, um, we're setting something like this up. Um, what is really good is to be able to have a community fund, and with our community fund. And the benefit of it is, or the focus of it is to um, is fuel poverty and tackle climate change. And so we've been able to distribute 90,000 pounds worth of profits um, into the community fund. And as a result, uh, we've been able to support projects like these. So this one here, just two case studies. Um, this is for a concrete edit, but it's for um, Art Pueblo's community gardens. Um, and it's a wonderful place and a little sanctuary really, uh, where they grow um, all organic produce and have a range of different activities for volunteers, uh, various groups come down, um, they support schools as well. And for them, they needed a new polytunnel um, so they can continue growing um, and also teaching um, in that uh, space. And so they put an application through and gave them three and a half thousand pounds a day to set up there. Um, in addition to that, um, we have Green's Windmill, and with Green's Windmill, this is uh, over at St. Anne's, uh, Depot Works, which has been running for 25 years, and um, for them, they have a straw rail, um, <coughs> over there, she's smiling, um, yes, so there's a straw rail unit, and so in fact, they had um, the funding, they were able to install solar um, panels, LED lights, and a battery as well. So um, there's two wonderful projects, and we have those more, um, but I just thought I'd give you an example of two of them. Um, and of course, what does it do? Um, it's, it's really important because, you know, like with um, AMC, they've been wanting this policy for few years, and when um, they found out that there was funding available, um, you know, they were delighted that we were able to uh, make this happen for them. So it does 
fast forward um, ideas for different community groups who are often struggling. Um, so the second project we're going to look at is Green Meadows. Um, and this is um, an exciting project because um, whilst we're very fortunate to get 1.5 million from the lottery from the lottery funding, um, that 1.5 million is there to tackle climate change in the Meadows community over the next five years. And um, this here, a vision to build a community that can solve climate change together towards net zero carbon emissions from the Meadows comes straight from the community. So Pat, who is wonderful, um, uh, I think everyone in the, in the Meadows community knows Pat, um, came to us. But this, all these here, I want us to come together to tackle the climate emergency. I wish the air was clean so I could breathe better. I'm worried about climate change. I wish people could help grow more trees and plants. And there's others there. I'm worried about wrecking the planet. These all are diet, these are exact quotes from an event that was held. The community saying we need help. Um, you know, you hear all the headlines in the news, we know things are going on, but how do we do this? Can you um, uh, support us? And so we did. We said we'd put a bit together, we were successful, and as a result, we had three areas that we are uh, focusing on, homes and buildings in the Meadows area, um, and also living in the future, and then, which is about people, and measure for success, which is kind of analysing everything. Um, I'm going to focus on two areas, and this is homes and buildings, and living in the future, so as it says, with homes. So these are just some of the activities, there's lots more. Um, and so this is the example where the community came to us, or different parts of the community came to us, and we said, right, let's form um, a more formal group so that we can um, make a difference in the meadows. So some of the things we're going to do, and we are doing already, is um, an energy, energy audit and uh, retrofit plans. And what that means is that we are off the free. And so we go into people's homes, very much like a retrofit assessment, um, but much more detailed um, because the Meadows happens to be a conservation area and we have lots of historic buildings. Um, but we are quite simply mapping out all the different archetypes in the, in the Meadows area um, so that we can come up with plans and blueprints essentially in how to retrofit them. Um, the practical workshops, which I've highlighted, um, really, this is why we were successful with our bid. Um, through uh, the, um, the, our funding bit, sorry. Um, and uh, so with the practical workshops, what we're doing here, we have um, an expert from uh, CAC, the Centre for Alternative Technology. And it's great because he's going to be present, um, he's delivering um, DIY workshops um, for the community, so they can understand how they can retrofit their home. So this means that people will be able to, especially for the historic buildings, they'll be able to do internal wall insulation, for instance, and they'll understand uh, the technicalities around that, about thermal bridging. So it's very, very detailed. Um, and we also will have a tool share. So we have a hub. So we've purchased, and P has purchased a building. And in that building, which is being uh, which is being uh, renovated now. Um, we will invite people down and they can learn, they can, well, first of all, um, whilst we will um, deliver the workshops there, they'll be able to hire equipment um, so they can do their various DIY jobs as well. Um, we can talk a little bit more about it later. Um, and then live for the future, and um, this is very much focused on um, people. So this is the whole thing of the one-to-one and community learning of knowledge bank climate champions. Climate champions is very exciting because again, it's encouraged the community to come to us. There's funding available for them to go to boot camps to understand more about climate change and also, but most importantly, to develop their ideas to tackle climate change. And so they'll be given that support. That's already started. I think the first round, uh, we wanted to sign up uh, five to six people. We have those people signed up uh, and they're attending the boot camp. Go back on a Sunday, some, some of the uh, sessions. But yeah, we'll go that extra mile to help people. 
Um, but it, um, one of the things is so with the lottery funds, which I think earlier, um, lottery funding, um, the focus is very much on um, revenue and not so much on capital. Um, and we really did need the capital in order to be able to do the um, retrofitting of homes. And so we have this uh, conservation retrofit catalyst project, not a nice one. Um, work on that. Um, but we, so we secured funding um, from Energy Redress, their innovation funding, um, to be able to deliver a capital program. And so we can um, tackle the uh, technical challenges that these historic buildings bring, and also um, look at you know, what the challenges are in trying to deliver retrofit programs in a conservation area. Um, Due to the number of conservation areas across the country, the idea is that we'll have this blueprint or this template, a toolkit, that, so that it can be rolled out um, to other areas. <coughs> so um, with this programme, we'll reduce carbon emissions um, quite significantly, um, because we'll improve the uptake of um, quality retrofits for uh, particularly older homes, older properties. And um, our approach really has three steps to it. The archetype study, mapping, mapping and modelling local building archetypes, um, and that's happening at the moment. Um, retrofit planning. Um, so this is the whole, the idea that we will provide um, a plan of a whole house retrofit. Well, you have to do it straight away, but you can do it in stages. And also with that, um, it's having that face to face time with the householder and really helping them to understand the benefits of the different measures and uh, their an approach, a sensible approach. And of course, the training, which I've mentioned already. Um, uh, so traditional building specific retrofit courses for trade people to increase supply chain and capacity and meet increasing demand. So alongside um, training for in the homes, also training for um, <coughs> So um, our final um, project is Green Grass, uh, or Green Grass Mad, which is the first you can see. Um, and so with this project, um, there's, it's making sure there's an area-based approach to delivery. Um, so that communities, and it's a really good example, for instance, in Rushcliffe um, here in Nottinghamshire, how they are delivering the programme in a particular ward. Um, and on a particular state or for a particular archetype, and this archetype has to, happens to be uh, steel frame properties, often left to last, often not um, able to be retrofitted through all the previous schemes that have been on offer through the government because they are difficult to improve verbally. Um, and so, what we're doing here is making sure that. Um, this particular archetype where it happens to be a more deprived area, um, that for those households, they are able to improve the thermal efficiency in their home. And it gets them all talking. So all of a sudden we have this community in you know, the first group in our second phase now, third phase. Um, first lot of people had it done, they say, I want to have it done now. So we're seeing neighbours have in their homes retrofitting and it's quite a beautiful site to be honest. Uh, so green for that. So what we're delivering here, I told you we're going to look at policy, and so we are delivering the sustainable warm competition, which is the latest uh, domestic uh, energy policy from the government. Um, it's a no national government grant, obviously, um, aimed at tackling fuel poverty with a focus on decarbonisation. The right aim is to raise the energy efficiency of building or homes, um, and then aiming for um, Ideally, C's and D's depend on the type of property. Um, but they're targeted, so we're targeting um, E to G rated properties, and now there's a 30% allowance of D rated properties. Uh, households need to be on a low income um, or an income of £30,000 or below <coughs> in order to be eligible. And the delivery is through all the local authorities. Um, and this is the thing with this is that. Uh, we, we had a situation 
um, in Nottinghamshire, where with the third round of babies, whereby local authority, yeah, three local authorities decided not to take funding. Um, now, I said earlier how um, some of the work we do is around program management and delivery. And as a result of those local authorities not taking funding, we stepped forward, we spoke to Nottinghamshire um, to to County Council, and we be in a position of putting together a consortium with those local authorities who decide not to take funding that's available. So, but always looking to see where there are opportunities to help uh, householders. Um, so our role, our main role with Tibbin Green Grants is um, our customer journey support, provider customer journey support. And, um, and I'm joined actually, she's just arrived, Emma. Ideas. If you have any questions about customer journey support, Emma's been working on the project since the start, and uh, there's a good side out there to um, She's very, very good. Um, but, and keeps everyone, the whole team together, um, making sure no one gets left out. Um, so the project value um, is 370,000, just over 370,000. And we have four um, main um, activities. Uh, areas to cover and that's support of the client. When it comes to supporting the client, um, essentially this is it. And when it comes to our delivery plan, this is it. There's kind of nine stages. Um, first of all, it's we are we do a bit of we sort out all the marketing and the lead generation. And more recently we, we do all the mapping to decide which areas um, the local authority should, should focus on. And with that marketing and lead generation, there's a range of different ways we do it. And um, we usually, uh, well, now we have some waste case we're able to tackle, which is marvelous. Um, but we map the areas, we send out letters. We're very fortunate these days where more people have emails, it makes the job a lot quicker. And um, we're even texting at certain stages to clients as well. Um, we hold road shows, so it's not all long distance. We go into the community and we set something up so that the community know who we are. In terms of once we've uh, generated leads, um, in order to, it's really important actually, as part of that lead generation, is to have um, a dedicated phone line, which we do. We also have online access as well, so that people can make their uh, inquiries that way. We take a full assessment. Um, so we take personal details, but importantly, we understand, get to understand about the property so that we can do certain things up front. <coughs> And we tried, and this whole process is to try and limit the number of times that we're contacting the client, but that we're contacting the client because there is a, a need rather than um, because we've forgotten something. So it's quite tight. And that we have, we collect details about the house so we understand the level of further efficiency. Um, we, under, we collect details about the person's health because they might have certain needs that the contract's going to go in needs to be aware of, needs to be respectful of. Um, we also at this. Can I just ask you on the client journey at that point of that of the journey for local authorities? You've got a fantastic level and range of expertise. I, I just wonder how much of that uh, that input goes into how local authorities are planning new build, as well as. The dealing with the existing stock. I mean, the Nottingham is an example of stuff that has been developed all over the place. One of the most worrying things is developers throwing up buildings that are massively energy hungry, don't generate any of their own energy, heavily dependent on mechanical uh, ventilation and cooling, and are just you know, pushing the net zero commitment. So I'm just wondering how far the expertise that you've built up is um, being taken advantage of by local authorities, just in not digging the hole any deeper. Did that? Well, did that we've only spread ourselves so far, I think. But we um, are you being asked? That's the one. No, we're not really. Um, I mean, our focus has always been on existing policies, existing buildings. Um, and not seeing them locked down um, so new buildings can go up. Um, and we really haven't been involved in those conversations. 
I mean, we cringe, obviously, when we think, oh, and we come across it all the time. So, like I was saying, the detail we collect about the properties, we see houses, just this week, actually, um, homes that have been built for the last 20 years, where they should have had sufficient insulation and they have not. Um, and developers have been able to get away with it, and obviously the house is built, and then discover that they've got two inches of long insulation, um, rather than required uh, amount of what requires that. Um, so no, we haven't been involved at all. It would be great, but actually no, I don't know. <laughs> Good question there. Um, so yeah, so we collect a lot of data. We do, so we do a lot of things up front before the information goes to the contractor. Um, we get the EPCs done, we get retrofit assessments done. Um, and it's just to limit those number, the number of times someone's knock on the client's door. Because we're dealing with vulnerable people. Our focus has always been about um, vulnerable households that need a little bit of hand holding. Um, and something we're going to incorporate, and this is it. So another important part of what we do, um, and it, with that program management, is learning lessons. So we feed those lessons in. And so we're always modifying, whilst we have our kind of template in terms of delivery, we're always modifying it because we have how to determine ways in which we can make the process more efficient. So um, thankfully, we don't have to worry about building control anymore. So the, the, the contractors do that. That's because of this new whole compliance. There's a uh, new um, uh, retrofit assessment, has 2035 um, compliance legislation standards. Um, whereby now the contractors have to liaise with the planning teams. Um, so that's done by the contractor, but we send all the details over to the contractor and technical surveys are done at this stage, um, scheduled works put together, client consents um, for the work is also gathered at this stage as well. I should have said as well, when we do the assessment, we also gain client consent. In between the um, the technical survey stage and the install stage, and um, something we've incorporated is setting out the home energy plan. And this is, again, this is a lesson learned. Just the way the government policy changes, comes in, last three years, very short time to get this type of work. Um, but what it also means is that local authorities sometimes are scrambling around trying to get installers onto the program to deliver the work. So the program can start with their installer. So clients can be waiting two, three months, four months or more um, for an install to happen. Not all, but sometimes for some for different local authorities. So we've tried, so we've done different things, <coughs> taken different approaches to make sure we're engaged with the client. So we no one can say what's happening. Um, and so we set up the energy pack and that outlines um, the process and expected timelines the contractors are, etc., etc. So they're more informed. Could you just give us an idea of that, the time scale of the journey, and also any one time? What is your sort of caseload of clients going through that process? Uh, so, in terms of time scales, ideal time. I do ideal time scales and real time scales. Actually, the, I, yeah, because the thing is, if we. With the green grant scheme, we're not doing the installing, we pass on to a contractor. Um, in, when we've done it with other projects, so I showed you that long list of projects, we employed the contractors, we trained them we, and we employed them. So we sent the referrals directly to them and we're always um, managing them. And then when we did that, um, we would say, well, home insulation, the cavity is not the easy jobs. Um, you've, you've got a two month turnaround. For solid wood insulation, it would be three to four months turnaround um, because it depends the weather thing. Um, but usually, you'd be on site for six weeks. Um, the contract would be on site for six weeks. But the most, you know, sort of three at a push, four months. The timelines in green grants has been a lot longer. Um, one area I talked about, you know, in brush pit, it's been very, very quick. Um, so we've just started, it's about three or four weeks ago, registering clients, households in Brushcliff, they're on a waiting list. We got that done, we hit their targets within two weeks, which was marvellous. Solid water station and solar PV, and they're having. And, um, and the installs will be starting, they're starting in a couple of weeks. So for them, it's two months, but then you've got some others, 
it's two to three months, and you've got some but other local authorities it's a lot longer. I just wonder if you're doing such brilliant work, and I wonder what the where what the constraint is on this kind of throughput that you can cope with. Oh, I see. So the thing is, um, but we do. There's a lot of scheduling. <laughs> <laughs> so. But we do, we schedule, we work, we're really adaptable. We've got uh, Emma's here. We have a really fantastic team. And um, it's like this morning. So we, it was like, we had a 10 minute um, conversation and we've got a mail out to do and we sorted it out, right. And it was, it was just a small one. So it was like, just over, I was about 130 or so. And it was a case of, right, we have the email addresses for these people. Let's get this done. That was done. And then all the, so it's about 90 people needed, we could email. And then there was 10 people that we needed to call. But we will do that, you know, like three times to make sure we get as many people as possible. So we are very adaptable. For the Green Grant Phase 2, there were, I think, 490 measures to be installed. So it's about 440 households that we dealt with. And that was in the space of six months. So, because there was a lot of, there was quite a few delays with contracts yeah. between the local authority and the contractors, um, we had to work really quickly. Another example, a really good example would be um, with one local authority, um, they came on board very, very late. They had a target of 157 um, measures to be installed, so the PV to be installed, and 30 EWI. And they came to us in December, two weeks before Christmas, and so, but the thing is, the install deadline it was March, it was March. So somehow they're gonna get this done. We had them all signed up, I think by the third week in January. And that was the whole market, getting the marketing out, all the letters, choosing the area, or well, mapping areas, sending the letters out to those properties, calling those people that we could because on our database, we thought that, you know, for them to have solar PV would make a difference because we knew they had solid wall insulation from one of the past projects. So that's all of that. So we do work really quickly. Um, <laughs> we try to. Because the thing is for us, there is a need, there is an urgent need. Whilst it's wonderful to see these projects, there ought to be more work happening. There ought to be more, you know, these budgets for uh, green grants ought to be bigger. Um, and that's the reality. But back in, you know, those past projects, we did we were doing more work then. Um, I think in terms of the targets, they were higher. They were definitely higher. So, Bill. Uh, not from the catch up, but you know what the practical spending is for the Oh, I knew, gosh. Oh, come back to me. You're not the just for the information, but I'll tell you, I'll come back to you later. <laughs> is this mainly driven around local authority properties? No, 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 not at all. It's all, anyway. sorry, it's private sector. Yeah. Private so, sector. yes. So um, there is a social housing decarbonisation decarbonization fund. In fact, there's a presentation today about that. Um, and that focuses purely on social housing. The Green Grants did contain a proportion of social housing, but it's, a, it's now, it went from last year from 30% now down to 10% of the budget. And I'll try and remember that, totally budget. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, so there's that need because of the timeline as some, you know, some households have been waiting six months for an install. That's the reality. Um, and that's, you know, like the good side and the bad side thing. Um, so this is why we try to make sure and we thought there's a need that people have these packs and it explains. And we have to customise them for different local authorities, understanding where they're at and what the likelihood is of uh, the household have been installed. So that's one of the key things that we're doing. And um, of course, we have the install, which is the contract's responsibility. Feedback is really important. Um, we do client satisfaction surveys um, for all of our clients, but then we create the case studies um, for um, which are wonderful and very interesting to, to read as well. And then also do promotional tools. And we'll have a look at the um, workshops, which we've incorporated as well. Um, I'm hoping this will play. Well, this is in the room. Um, it used to be so cold in here, especially in the winter time. 
For more than four decades, Judy struggled to stay warm in her elated steel framed house, but now that's all changed. Yeah, I can't believe it. So I'm heated now. Well, I've got it switched off now because it's so hot in here. What's made the difference is the house is now wrapped in 15 centimetres of solid wall thermal insulation installed two weeks ago. Thousands of these steel framed houses were built in the UK after the Second World War and they're notorious for leaking heat. Before the work, Judy's energy bills had shot up from 90 to 160 pounds and she was considered vulnerable. I said to her, are you sure it's, you know, going to be free? Because you're not getting anything free. And the same thing, yes, you don't contribute anything. So, you know, I kept painting them all. I said, are you sure? <laughs> 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 Energy Hub successfully bid for a green homes grant from the government. 17 other homes will get the same treatment, each costing around £10,000. Charity Nottingham Energy Partnership worked with Russian Borough Council to find those most in need. So did he see me? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's a really lovely case study. So obviously it was very fortunate for us we were able to film that one. And we do try to film as well. We always ask the clients if they're happy. Um, and uh, we also put together um, some uh, hard copies which I brought up today. Importantly though, is to, I talked about this need for education. And so as part of that program, so that was a rush gift, they still great properties. We went out and we uh, delivered um, a workshop. And the workshop was to um, give people a better understanding, more in-depth understanding as to what the project is delivering. And uh, everyone was welcome and um, uh, lived on that estate. And, um, but also to go into a bit more detail about the measures they were having installed into their home. And in addition to that, to sign them up to home visits. And home visits being about uh, for all of those, once they've had the install, for us to go in and explain how those systems work. And this is the educational part. And it's really important. It was great. So we've done some of those. And just if we said, yeah, because I didn't understand, I didn't know if the SOPB was working. And um, because contractors are supposed to explain that it's on and that it's working or that they're they don't need to do anything else and they don't necessarily do that. And it's this in this day and age of technology, warranties are being sent out by email. And people don't know they've got them because they don't necessarily check their emails. Um, or they weren't aware that, was, that the reason why they asked for their email address is because they were going to send them the warranty. So we go through a lot of that as well. But um, those are past lessons learned. So anyway, so what we will do, and it's just an example, is we explain. So in terms of the green rugs, um, we're talking all together um, a cost generally around about the £20,000 mark um, when people are having soil wall insulation installed, um, solar PV as well. And uh, it's costly. No one on the low income is going to afford that, sorry. We'll send, we will send all these out afterwards. So. But that's wrong. No, I think I think it's fine. So, oh, so I'm just wondering what would be the PC, PC, what was supposed to say? Oh, oh no, just they didn't have to pay for it. So oh. this is well, this is these are all here. They didn't have to pay for the solid wood insulation yeah. or the solar PV or the EPC. So to start the work, they have to make sure they qualify, they need to have the EPC and it needs to be rated between D to G. And um and so we pay for that EPC. Against the EPC, for example. Oh, sorry, that's uh, that should be urged. I think it should be down here. Ah, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> that was spotted, Tony. She's not spotted, so don't look at that. Yeah. She's not spotted. Can I ask about any more questions if you grab Miranda or yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. Sorry. Um, so, anyway, so that's the cost in terms of the savings, in terms of the cost, in terms of the annual savings on those fuel bills, fuel bill that should be there. I do apologise. Um, we are looking at it, yeah, so it'll come down, so it comes to about 600 pounds in terms of their savings on their field bills. Well spotted. I didn't really put in there, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, but we go through this sort of thing as well with the client, just to let them, so they can see the benefits of the work that they've had done. Because a lot, a lot of them, um, they're not necessarily find that out on the contractor. Um, additional support, I mentioned earlier, just briefly. So these are some of the things here in terms of heating, 
um, oil replacement, home insulation, oil reduction, these are some of the additional services that we offer, but also the benefit service debt management, priority services register, hardship funding applications as well. We do a lot of those. Um, and it's wonderful you know, when you apply to all the different um, charities and you're able to get sometimes you know, a few thousand pounds in for people to get work done. Um, all around energy efficiency, obviously, but um, it's great. Um, it's great for the uh, household. Um, and of course, the workshops. So one of the other things, again, coming back to the whole education, so when we're out doing those workshops, is introducing things like this, fabric first, so that people understand um, that your windows are, you know, if you change your windows, if your house is not insulated at all, um, please don't start it with fingers. So we'll explain this whole approach to fabric first, because we get it all the time, um, about, you know, essentially, you know, wrap your house up. Keep it nice and warm, get the insulation to the walls and the roof, and we go through that in a bit more detail. And that is one of the key messages with all the key aims of the Green Grant Scheme. Um, and of course, uh, it reduces money costs, increases energy saving, and also reduces carbon emissions. Um, and so that's just showing the community to workshops um, and the fact that we have a range of topics as well. So we are, um, the focus is moving on to, um, so it's talking about solar PV, all the different measures that are available, but particularly renewable energy, solar PVs, air source heat pumps, um, so that, you know, that awareness of the benefits of them is more obvious. So last slide. Um, so this is some of our future work that we're looking at. I'm really excited to put a bid in um, to see if we can run a project looking at boiler optimization. And um, so this is the whole idea of reducing the flow temperature um, of the boiler so that um, it runs more efficiently because condensing boilers, that is, uh, condensing coffee boilers, uh, seeing if we can have a campaign for going to people's homes to directly give them the information um, and guidance in order to do that. So we're very, very excited about that and I hope that will come through. And if you want to know more about boiler optimization, speak to Philip back. It's his little uh, pet subject. And he, who knows, he might come around to show you how to do it. <laughs> anyway, and then the other thing as well is, again, going back to those workshops and the whole idea of education and more people get the community understanding about this move towards to, uh, decarbonising heat and so on is, uh, getting together, uh, putting um, a workshop together and putting it out to everyone um, or advertising those so that people can come along and understand more about air source heat pumps as well. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, so getting through Miranda's details there. And if there's any more questions for Miranda, I'm sure you can grab her or Emerald Phil um, yeah, during the breakouts or, or during lunch as well. But yeah, really, really interesting presentation and great to hear about all the different projects uh, that any of you do and how, how you use funding and how you use the reach to keep the community. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's really fascinating to see. And we will be sending these slides around after the event as well, so you can all, so you can all see them. Um, but now it's time for our breakout sessions. Slightly later, it's going to be advertised on the agenda, you'll notice. So we'll, we'll be running these up to, up to 12 o'clock and then we'll do a quick tea break. Um, so, as I mentioned before, when everyone signed up, um, if you did sign up online, we actually just pick one of, one of the topics. Um, so, I'll just read out a bit of school register for the different groups and then we'll do a bit of musical chairs. Um, to sort you out into these different groups. So we're going to be running the innovation breakout room in that room at the back with myself and Faithful. So in that we've got Alan, Louise. Um, I'm just at the back. Can you be in the room? I can hear you. Perfect. That's yeah. cool. Okay, that's fab. Um, and just before I start, um, I would love to just do a check in the room. For, so I don't want to assume that people know who can eat it and do it that is. Um, so I saw uh, you earlier on doing some hand signals, so I think if it's okay. If, um, and I'm just going to bring it into the room, um, if you know what Community Energy England is as an organisation, if I could just have to do this, and if you don't, that's absolutely fine. It's just a bit of a knowledge check. So I'm like, okay, about half. 
Wow. Okay, that's great. Um, so my name's Shannon. Um, I work for Community Centre England in the networks and learning and now membership as well, just giving me more and more parts of the organisation. Um, and I was here to do a, a summer update in terms of what we've been doing for the sector um, and how to plug into that. Um, and so just a bit of an introduction to who we are. Uh, we are kind of one of the national uh, networkers to support the sector. Our mission is to accelerate innovation projects, growth, um, and constantly looking to improve. Um, so we are now at, we've just had a massive uh, influx of membership. So we're now at 300 members uh, plus uh, across the country. So we're uh, across different geographies. Um, and our kind of role is to connect organisations up with wider partnerships and to keep building um, together to make those connections. Um, in terms of updates and what we've been delivering for the sector in 2022 and how you can kind of plug into that in the next few months and what to look forward to. Um, the first thing, uh, as Kai mentioned earlier, is um, we are in a, a very intense period right now. It's very exciting for Community Energy Fortnight. Uh, it's a two week uh, annual uh, program of events that happens every year where we kind of get to celebrate community energy. We do it as a national kind of event series so that organizations can plug in and they can put their own events on. Um, and we also have a few kind of flagship events. So this year, kind of with um, the energy price crisis and particularly looking at the importance of retrofit for in communities with fuel poverty, we have an efficiency first uh, focus. Um, so one of the things I just wanted to highlight in terms of what we're doing for the sector is we've got 20 uh, flagships events with different partners. Um, so they're happening right now. We had um, our Celsius fuel poverty training um, just at the start of the week, and I believe there's an event tonight as well. Forgive me, I can't remember which. There are lots of events happening. Um, but there are 20 flagship events with partners up and down the country, so just flagging them to please go and check out if you would like to. 60% um, of the, the sessions that are on Community Energy Fortnite this year are training uh, relevant, So and they're all free. So, um, it's open to, to members um, and to non-members as well. So please do plug in uh, to that uh, real focus this year. The other thing I wanted to highlight is we've got our energy advice challenge for 2022. And this was um, our mission working with, uh, with Bayes and also the NEA um, to try and get as many uh, community groups ready for winter 2022 and delivering energy advice. Um, so what we are what we are doing is um, we are working with the NEA to get as many community groups and individuals uh, trained to the level three energy awareness standard um, and looking to subsidise and fund that as well. So if anyone is interested in terms of accessing uh, energy advice training and particularly in partnership with local authorities, kind of being able to deliver um, on behalf of, uh, please check out the website because we are offering that right now and we're looking to start training. Uh, and kind of later autumn, winter, um, and build a bigger program from that. The final thing I wanted to highlight just as part of Community Energy Fortnite is, uh, it might be a bit of a last minute trip for anyone, um, but if you are free on Saturday, we've also got our summer conference, which uh, is in partnership with the Bristol Energy Network. Um, and we've got kind of sponsors like uh, Bristol County Council um, and Thrive Renewables and Unity. So it's a really, uh, really exciting event, first one back. Um, and it's looking at innovation across the sector. So one of our key partners across the country is uh, the Bayes Innovation Hubs so and the Net Zero Hubs. So they will be uh, there kind of um, talking about everything that's happening in different geographies across the country as well. So a really exciting event. You can still sign up if you would like to. Um, no worries if you don't fancy a trip. You can for um, but that is also happening this Saturday. The other thing that has been mentioned today uh, one of the key areas which we look to support the sector in is um, helping us all make our case for the value of community energy and getting those kind of facts and figures that just really help us uh, working with new partners and kind of showing the value that we know we deliver for people that's quantify. Um, so kind of some stuff that we are recently just released, we've got a new benefit uh, and impact, uh, a few series of reports looking at kind of internally what benefits do we provide to our volunteers and our membership and our investors, showing that we do give back um, 
box to everyone that kind of is internally part of, of everything that we're doing. Um, and we've also got impact reports in terms of what we are doing for the, the wider sector of the country as well. We've got a state, uh, every year we do a state of the sector report, uh, which kind of looks at what has happened over the past year. Um, and it's always really uh, exciting um, to kind of get, get, those, uh, get those things in. So just to help kind of make, make the case for, in particular, what we, um, what we have been seeing, um, it is a real renewed focus on efficiency. I mentioned uh, kind of some things around that uh, in a second, but kind of uh, being able to quantify um, that uh, energy efficiency interventions from community energy groups specifically uh, have saved 3.35 million in UK energy bills over the past year. So that's just 2021. Um, and 70% of uh, the spending from community energy groups in energy efficiency interventions go back to the local economy. So almost 15 million pounds have been brought back into local economies. So things like state of the sector are trying to kind of hand, um, and it's a much wider report. So there's lots in there, um, just picking out a few kind of screenshots from it, but helping us make our case to, um, to other partners that this is why we should get behind community energy because it delivers more. Um, we've also got infographic series on the sector as well, which I'll show a few in a second. Um, so this is, uh, I didn't go into, um, into too much detail because I've got a uh, spot before lunch and I'm aware everyone is probably hungry. Um, but this is kind of the infographics that are included in the report, some really exciting stuff uh, around kind of the level of membership in community energy, the amount that we're generating um, and the, this kind of rise of uh, energy efficiency work as well and how much we're saving and generating in terms of funding and finance as well. A really interesting thing uh, in this year's report. Um, so we're doing kind of this stuff around kind of uh, the infographic series on the level of return on investments that you get, um, particularly in things like fuel poverty. There's a recent uh, report, um, a partnership we've just done with the uh, Bristol Poverty Institute, which shows that um, community energy delivery uh, can achieve a 10 to 1 return on uh, investments made and the level of added social value that you get back. Um, so please use them um, and uh, we're looking to kind of keep support in that. In terms of one of the interesting things from the state of the sector this year was looking at, as I said before, kind of this real push in the importance of energy efficiency. Um, and that was twinned with um, finding that the level of projects in generation uh, being stalled is also increasing. So that was also one of the key findings. Um, Forgive me, I can't remember the exact percentage increase from 2020 to 2021, um, but I believe uh, it was around kind of 35% increase in the amount of projects that are stalling as well. So it's pushing some of groups into looking at not putting up generation assets, but getting involved in more community-based support, particularly around fuel poverty, uh, energy advice cafes, low carbon transport as well, things like that. And then just to flag some kind of wider resources that, uh, that we've got coming up, which I'm very, very excited at. So because we collate all of this kind of national research, uh, in particular the state of sector, um, the state of sector from this year is really exciting because we've been doing state of the sector since 2017. Um, but this was the first year where we didn't just get the annual research for 2021 to 2022. We actually collated all of the um, data from 2017 to now. So we've collated kind of five years worth of data. What we're looking to do with that, and we're looking to launch this in kind of later summer, is um, one of the uh, most comprehensive national maps of community energy. Um, the reason why we are also doing this is we're very, very aware that a lot of the funding is coming through local authorities right now and to 2025 multi-year funds uh, around the social housing decarbonisation scheme around the P, uh, public sector decarbonisation uh, scheme, around the levelling up funds. And we want to show our case for community energy, which starts from showing it visually. So um, this is looking to be launched in late summer. Um, it's open to our, to our members and partner organisations um, and, and we'll be kind of sharing that. Um, so just a really exciting bit of uh, data that is kind of coming through in a resource to use. Um, on community energy England. And then in terms of how to, to plug in, um, so we have uh, different kind of levels of membership 
uh, we make membership work for our organisations because our um, key thing is that we want to support the sector and people to get involved and to keep going. So out of our 300 members, 147 are on free annual membership. So you can join Community Energy England for free. Um, it's a pay, it's pay as you can kind of donation based on your annual income. So if you're a startup group, also if um, you just don't have the, the funds right now, we make it work. Um, the other thing to kind of flag is we really want community energy groups and community groups to get their councils involved. Things like the national map is a really uh, exciting development. Um, and we want councils to come with us on the journey as well. Um, so we're just getting part of the influx of membership that's come through is more particularly parish and town councils. Really, really excited by this. Um, so please encourage people to get involved. And through that, you can access all of this training, all the events and the wider resources. And that's me. Um, <laughs> up in Scotland, uh, looking very happy. Um, so yes, uh, if there's any questions or queries, I'm here uh, in the event, but this is also my contact information. Um, and please do just yeah, come with anything um, and take any questions. And then that's great. And I just think you're wonderful. Oh, in thank what you. You're doing <laughs> and bringing us all together. So that's, that's magic. Just as a benchmark, in, in Nottingham, we've got a local authority that is committed to being carbon neutral by 2028. Brilliant. Its first year report um, showed that what they've been able to do was cut their carbon emissions by 4%. But to meet the 2028 targets, the officers were telling them that they had to be cutting by 24% a year, every year, to 2028. So this is a scale of, uh, of, of transformation, way beyond telling the staff to work harder. <laughs> what, have you got any transformative ideas that you can offer to local authorities and local communities that would say, you know, if we're into that scale uh, of transformation, can we start from this, this and this? Yeah, yeah, and I think it's um, that idea of scale is one of the biggest barriers that uh, we just started working with um, as a public sector decarbonisation scheme, PSDS3 working group um, that currently exists to support local authorities to prepare their investment plans. What they want is they want shovel ready scale projects, uh, multi technology. Um, and when we mention community energy, they expect small, tiny groups that are doing, you know, the local kind of turbine or, or uh, PV or things like that. Um, and so, yeah, part of the, the key measures that we're pushing right now is, is showcasing those innovative at scale projects, which, of which there are. So one of the things that we are uh, introducing um, to the PSDS funding is there was, um, and I, yeah, I know about this because I worked for the organization. So I worked for an organization called Southern Schools before coming to Community in England. They did a 25 million pound decarbonization um, scheme where they put solar on, I think, 14 schools across Leeds City Council, matched it with heat pumps. But local authorities don't know about that. So it's trying to spread, spread that message and all the, the great stuff around flexibility. And there's so much innovation in the sector, but we haven't done a great job of showcasing it yet. So yeah, it's a huge, a huge thing to try and get the message of scale across that we can deliver that. I think there's a requirement for engagement with the uh, planning authorities, the local planning. You keep banging it against the big wall. And the other, the other driver that you could massively tip the housing market on its head is in key PC to stand each payment. And not to give the money just to the government, they get 50%, say, 50% is locked against that house for retrofit or improvement or community energy. One of the things that we when we work with local authorities, what they tell us is they 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 basically want us to lay out the pathway for them. Like they just say, what do you want us to do? <clears throat> One of the cases that we're trying to make is, is that you need to devolve funds. So set up um, a funding pot, which community groups can access and, and it's for projects like that. So it's not just coming through the local authorities, you're actually using that and then you're putting it into the hands of the community because they can do no offense to local authorities, but often a better job in terms of delivering on the, on the value as well. So. Um, part of what we're trying to lay out, not only to local authorities, but partner organisations, um, is 
um, evolving those funds as well. So making sure each geography has funding that groups can access to deliver this work that needs to happen absolutely urgently. Yes. Great. Thanks, Shannon. Um, if there are any more questions for Shannon, which I'm sure there are, do grab her over lunch or get into Twitter. Um, at those at those contract details below. But yeah, really great to hear about what's going on across the country. So yeah, thank you, Shannon. Great. Um, like that, we'll hand it over to Dave from Chair Energy, who's going to talk about their post-season tariff community energy projects. Um, and the um, so Dave, Right, okay. <laughs> uh, right, I want to say before I start that uh, I'm um, Secretary of Shropshire and Telford Community Energy, and we joined Community Energy England, and we would advise us to do the same. And I don't know, I, um, I was checking my emails, so I, I didn't hear all of your presentation. It's a, bit, it's a very bad habit of mine. Um, but um, membership of Community Energy England is free if you don't own an asset. So, um, you know, and when you get to own an asset, you should be able to afford to pay the, the, the higher fees that are available. So I'm development manager for Share Energy, so I'm also secretary of Shropshire and Telford Community Energy. I used to be director of Shrewsbury Hydro, and I used to work for the Household Energy Service, which was a community energy efficiency project working in deepest, darkest South Shropshire. Um, but I'm here to talk about two uh, East Midlands projects um, that have been funded by the Rural Community Energy Fund, RCEF, which is run by the Midlands Net Zero Hub. As I say, unfortunately, RCEF um, is no more. Um, um, Governments love messing around, don't they? If something's working, they'll fund it for a bit, and then and then uh, they say, oh, we're, we need to do something else now. Um, RCEF is no more. And there was rumour about it being replaced by a community energy fund, which would cover urban areas as well. But now the government line seems to be to that people will need to apply for levelling up funds in similar, similar bodies. And of course, there, if you do that, then you are competing with all sorts of other projects within those, <coughs> within those funding. So, um, yeah, that, it was a brilliant scheme. Um, unfortunately, applications are now closed. So, Share Energy, we're based in Shrewsbury, right over on the Welsh borders. Um, we're a cooperative helping people set up renewable energy societies across the UK. We've basically got two main teams. Uh, I'm development manager, so I'm all about funding projects and helping people to set up societies and, and get their projects on the road. But we also do uh, administration for existing uh, societies. I think we've got something like 50 societies on our books whereby we help with <coughs> varying levels of, of their admin, running their share registers, doing their accounts, running their AGMs for the rest of it. <coughs> Um, oh, and by the way, if you want to look us up, share energy is one word and it's only got one E in the middle. So really it should be share energy or share energy, whichever you want. But anyway, if you, if you Google share energy as two words, you might not find us. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is uh, in Grassington in heat, net, um, heat network. And um, this is down, this is project is basically down to the work of one, one very energetic, I, I hope he doesn't mind me letting on that he's 83, uh, one very energetic 83 year old uh, has got this whole project together and you'll, you'll, hopefully you'll see him in a minute in, in a clip. So Brassington is a classic Derbyshire Dales uh, village. Uh, it has got some more modern housing, but there is a significant core of older um, stone properties off the gas grid and a bit hilly. So it has 230 houses, two pubs, primary school and a village hall. That's it. There are no businesses. There are no, um, you know, um, there's nothing that we could really put um, rooftop PV on. And, um, um, it's off the gas grid, so virtually everyone's got oil or LPG heating. Uh, there are a few properties with individual heat pumps, but this isn't feasible for much of the village. When uh, the government is really pushing the idea of heat pumps, I've got an air source heat pump on my house. It works great. If anyone wants to talk to me about it later, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to do so. 
but I've got a nice semi-detached house with plenty of room to, to put an outside unit on and all the rest of it. When you get to these sorts of places, there's just, you know, there's certainly not room for ground source heat pump, but it'd be very difficult to find places with air source heat pumps as well. So we're looking at the idea of, of a heat network for the town. Um, now I know um, those of you who have been involved in, with the modern part of the meadows, would probably might not be so enthusiastic about heat network projects because I, I, I know that had a long history of you you Alan you were involved with the meadows were you yes but only uh, because the, the experience in St Andrews was such uh, disastrously organised the meadows managed to fend off having uh, oh is it St Anne's I'm thinking of well, the 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 system, the meadows. I think I met you in 1974. <laughs> when I was when I was actually an architecture student in Nottingham. So anyway, so we've we've run this modeling. There's this amazing software called Thermos, and it will it basically taken uh, energy performance certificate data and it sort of said, well, there's there's various uh, alternatives you could do from you know just really doing just the core of the core of the village to to try to fit the whole village onto a, onto a heat network and we've looked at it with um with consultants called um carbon alternatives who are based in oxford um and we've looked at various options for air source heat pumps air source heat pumps supplied by uh, powered by a wind turbine uh, biomass and ground source heat pumps. And the only one that really works is the air source heat pump powered by a wind turbine. This is a great combination because the selling the electricity from the wind turbine to the, to the heat network gives you increased viability for the wind turbine and having the cheaper electricity from the wind turbine gives you increased viability for the heat network. Mm -hmm. So that would be a brilliant, brilliant solution. So can I just ask you on that, which is fantastic. Have, have you at any stage looked at what they have been doing in Kielan in the Netherlands, where they drilled down into their disused mine shafts and took the heat in the flooded galleries? And I ask because Derbyshire is yes. sitting, you know, I mean, it's estimated that we've got what, 25,000 disused mine shafts in the UK? Yes. One in four of our properties are within heating, just a heating distance of yes. that sort of renewable yes. supply. There's actually a very interesting project underway in Oldham doing exactly that, taking heat from, from disused coal mines. Uh, I think here we have a number of problems. One is that the if you look at the geological map, it's all over the place. <laughs> it's not one, you, you know, so if you start drilling down, you've no idea what rock you're going to get into. And then a lot of the mines are older mines that are backed and are, you know. So I think it might work better somewhere where you've got a larger colliery, uh, where you know you know what the flooding situation is and all that. If everyone's interested in that, look up the Oldham scheme. I've got reference in it to it in a magazine I was reading on the train on the way over here. So basically, that, that scheme might work for the village, but these figures are assuming a very high take up um, from the. Um, so, you know, if, if everybody in the village signed up to the heat network, then we could, you know, our figures show a return on investment of around 4.9%. 4, 4 You're not going to get 100% people signing up. That's, that's, that's um, just not going to happen. 80% it's still reasonable, 60% we're dropping down to two and a half percent. So it's 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 um, it's doable, but uh, it's starting to look a bit less attractive. I think we would struggle to get any any more than 60% take up. Um, so uh, if this scheme is going to go ahead, then um, Brasselton Community Heat are going to have to show a very high level of uh, interest for the scheme to go ahead. I would compare this, we're doing a very similar project in Bishop's Castle in South Shropshire. There, we've got a community college theatre, swimming pool, uh, a big sawmill, 
So there we should be able to do a similar scheme, but uh, make it viable with much lower take up from households. So the message we're giving to giving back to Brian is yes, this could work, but you're going to have to show very high levels of support. And um, now luckily, um, if you, um, I don't know if you know the area well, Brassington is just west of Carsington and sort of southwest of Matlock. And there are existing wind turbines that you can just see from the village. Uh, you can see the tip of the tip of the thing circulating from. Um, so basically, yeah. one idea is to run an extension lead down from the existing wind farm <laughs> down to the village uh, to power our wind turbine. We actually managed through Community Energy England. Uh, they have a really good. Um, um, what's it, well, there's a forum for oh, Lumio. Yeah. Lumio. Yeah. It's a practitioner's forum. So I put a message out on, on the Lumio saying, has anybody got contact in Orange? And I got three responses. And we've been trying for ages before then to get into Orange. And one of them worked. So um, they, are, they are interested in potentially supplying electricity to the heat network. Their stumbling point is they're not sure they want to import electricity when their wind turbines aren't operating. So they say, can't we get a, a separate supply? <laughs> um, but that, that's, that's difficult, technically. We have looked at building our own wind turbine because, of course, um, there's this thing called additionality. You know, the more, it's, it's all very well using electricity from existing wind turbines, but that's, that's not additional, is it? That's, that electricity will be going elsewhere. Um, um, and this is where we, we, we ran into problems with the faults on the network, we were told basically. Uh, we couldn't do that for five years. There's also a planning issue. I hope we might be able to get away with this one because we've been putting our wind turbine right next to the existing ones. But the planners at the moment are sticking to their national planning guidance says that you can't do it. Um, which. Uh, we hope the government would change their planning guidance at the moment they show no sign of doing so. So it, it will produce very high carbon savings, supply cheaper, less smelly energy to local residents. One thing with a heat network is you've got to be able to supply your energy cheaper than people are paying at the moment. Otherwise, why would anybody sign up? Um, normally, what they've done, the, the biggest uh, example of this so far in the UK is Swap and Prior, which is being constructed at the moment. And the offer there is if you sign up at the beginning, your connection is free. And then, you know, if your boiler is old, that immediately saves you money because you're not having to maintain and replace your existing oil boiler. Obviously, if you, start, if you decide in two or five years' time you want to join the network, there will be a fee because we would have to come back and dig up the pavements and, and do all the rest of it. Um, we held a very well attended public meeting. Remember, this is a village with 230 houses. We had over 50 people in the hall, which uh, amazing. The free wine and cheese afterwards might be, <laughs> but, uh, but, but why not? You know, that's uh, um, but they will have to show very strong local interest if the project's to move forward. It's a link on the next slide, so. I'm hoping we can understand it or maybe at the back. Brian Bammy is trying to start a small green revolution in this corner of the Derbyshire Dales. Well, it's our first public meeting uh, with Sharon and Jeff. We hope they're going to tell us that what we want to do is feasible. Feasibility was Brian's business as a former aerodynamics engineer for Rolls Royce, and he's still experimenting. If you look down there, you can see my PD cells. And that's my bridge turbine. After installing Brassington's first air source heat pump, he began reading about community heating networks. We were a village which was crying out for something to be done on, on a community basis. So he tapped into some grants to run a village survey and asked consultants share energy <coughs> to write a feasibility study. I think this is this is one of the one of the most interesting projects we're we're working on, and, and certainly the most innovative in terms of providing the heat network 
with electricity from a from a wind farm. The idea is that we would have a centralized energy center um, that could generate heat and send it around the village um, so that people don't can get rid of their smelly oil boilers and their oil tanks. That's music to the ears of people like Paul Epplestone. Uh, this is something I'd like to get rid of because in the last year oil has gone up times three, but primarily uh, we want to follow a green agenda in everything we do and everything the way we live. I think working together is probably the only way you're going to, you're going to improve on things. Around 50 villagers were at least willing to listen to proposals for communal air source heat pumps, thermal stores, and even a community wind turbine. Hoping to uh, get something more um, environmental than using oil, which is also very expensive. I think we all need to be aware of climate change and the effect we're all having in a village where there's no gas supply, so it's coal or wood burners and things like that. So environmentally, we all need to take responsibility for my grandchildren's and everybody else's grandchildren's futures. Community heating networks take years to build. They need wide-scale support, planning permissions and finance. But Brian's meeting was packed. So there certainly seems to be energy here to get things started. Sally Bowman, BBC East Midlands Today, Derbyshire. Um, right, so that's Brassington. And then I want to talk with you about Matlock. We've talked solar. So here, um, Derbyshire Dales Community Energy, they'd already had um, an RCF Stage 1 grant. Um, and they came up with two potential roofs sites, one was the secondary school and one was this Twigs, who um, they're big steel stockholders, but they also have this sort of tool, tool shop thing. So uh, there was about 200 kilowatts there, potentially. Um, the school site is reasonable, but, but not brilliant, because schools generally open five days a week and shut for six weeks in the summer. So, you know, we need to Without the feeding tariff, we need to sell the electricity, a, a considerable proportion of the electricity to the occupiers of the building. So we think it will stack up there because they will use almost 100% when they are open. Um, and the fact that it's uh, closed during the summer um, shouldn't be an issue. Uh, with Twigs, we've got more of an issue in that um, that building itself doesn't use enough electricity. But their stockholding building, the steel stockholders, is literally straight across the road. That's got an asbestos roof and some shading. So we don't want to put the PV on the asbestos roof, but we're probably going to put it on the, on the stockholders, but then uh, on the on the shop and offices, but then uh, feed it across the road um, to the stockholders where they when they use more electricity. Um, we were concerned with, without. Uh, Without the feeding tariff, the Community Benefits Society is, is, is in a really risky situation. The feeding tariff was a guaranteed income. You know, you can put 20 kilowatts on, on a primary school or a community centre. You, you would know exactly what income you were going to get over the next 20 years. Now, there's no feeding tariff. If you're going to put PV panels on somebody's roof, you've got to... And I would say a lot of the early... Uh, community energy renewable schemes were actually giving the electricity away when the when the feeding tariff was was that generous it wasn't worth charging for the electricity now we have to be able to sell the electricity to the occupants of the building we can offer them a discount you know somewhere between 10 and 20 percent on the electricity they get from us um, but if you've only got panels on you know one or two buildings then you're at great risk of one of those buildings or both of those buildings becoming unoccupied and you lose all your income, which is obviously a great risk. You write that into your share offer document and an awful lot of people are going to say, that's too risky for me, I'll go elsewhere. Um, so basically our job has been to expand the search. We found a number of extra rooms giving a total potential portfolio of around a megawatt, a thousand kilowatts, so five times the size We've now got 10 roofs rather than two. Uh, it's including a leisure centre, a community centre, fruit and veg wholesalers. The fruit and veg wholesalers is a really interesting one because it's not that big a building and it looks like a warehouse. And you're thinking, oh, they can't be as much electricity. It's crammed full of chillers. 
there are huge walk-in fridges, sort of nearly as big as this room, um, and their electricity use is phenomenal, um, and three factories. Um, they're exactly the sort of buildings we need to find. Um, care homes are good. Um, um, yeah. Um, so we've done this um, design um, for the Matlock Leisure Centre. Um, they were, they were the, the council were a bit iffy. This is a curved roof. And they said, oh, we don't want PV panels on a curved roof. That won't look that nice. Um, so our next job is to persuade them that actually, actually, this roof should be covered as well. Um, why not have PV panels on a curved roof? I don't see, I don't see the problem. Um, but anyway, the initial design um, didn't. And uh, <coughs> this, this, you can do a design like this on open source software called Open Solar. Anyone can sign up for it. And Big Solar Co-op offers training sessions in, in showing people how to use this software. When you got that picture up, could you just say whether that density of the occupancy of the roof is, a, is, typically, is it typically as high as that? That seems to seem better. Well, this is... The amount of the roof you're actually using. Yeah, but this is a leisure centre with a, yeah. with a huge energy use. But so I mean, to be able to get that many panels without any obstructions or problems? Yeah, yeah, no. A lot of roofs have you know, roof lights and lots of chimneys and thing, you know, little bits on the roof that you've got to avoid. This is unusual. I mean, particularly this curved roof. roof. That yeah, curved roof is, that. that's very unusual to get. I think it on the other side, it's well. really good. Um, and um, yeah, it's facing east-west. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? <clears throat> I mean, most people will say, oh, PV panels have got to be south-facing. Well, you do get a higher annual output from a south facing panel, but you get this big peak in the middle of the day. So you will probably end up having a much higher export. Whereas if you've got east west facing panels, you get less in the year, but you get a much better spread over the day, much flatter peak, less chance of export. So actually, it's not necessarily a bad thing at all. Um, I'd say most of the sites we've, we've visited, Matt, lot were very interested, keen to find out more. Expectations are high, though. People are thinking we're going to come along and, you know, reduce their electricity bills by fifty percent or more, and that ain't that ain't going to happen, basically. Um, so, on a site where we supply twenty five percent of their electricity needs and a twenty percent discount, we're saving them five percent on their electricity bills. I mean, that can be significant. You know, if you're spending £100,000 a year on electricity, 5% is worth having. But, you know, you have to manage expectations that we're not, you know, their, their <coughs> electricity bills are not going to disappear or reduce by 50%. It's more likely to be 5 or 10% of their electricity. Um, but they will, probably, they will probably need some additional drivers to, to take part in that project. Um, one of the companies I've been working with in Shropshire have basically been told by their American owners that they've got to reduce their carbon emissions. So actually, we can go along and put PV panels on their roof. It helps them to achieve their carbon reduction target um, with no capital out there. So uh, that's, that's the advantage here. So the next question um, Derbyshire Dells Community Energy will need to address is, should they go ahead and deliver this portfolio of sites on their own? Or would it be better to hand it over to a larger society such as the Big Solar Company? So I, I did declare an interest in this in the, in the breakout session earlier. The Big Solar Co-op was incubated by Share Energy. So uh, uh, there's a, a slightly incestuous relationship there, but uh, um, I will try to be um, as unbiased as possible. But uh, it's now set up as a separate co-op. The aims of the big solar are to deliver community rooftop solar at scale to spread the risk. Delivering at scale means we can improve procurement and maintenance. An awful lot of community energy schemes, they've got the scheme together and they just go to somebody and say, can you put some panels on our roof? And then once they're up on the roof, nobody thinks to actually go and check that they're still working or if they're clean or, or the rest of it. Um, 
And also, one of the other things we look at, which I think is quite interesting, is and I hope you will find it interesting as well, is that we're looking to avoid the use of panels made by slave labour in China. So you know, we can source <clears throat> we can source European-made panels and go through that whole procurement process. They're more expensive, um, but uh, you know, I really don't think we should be knowingly buying panels <coughs> made by slave labour. We wouldn't accept a cheaper quote for the install from somebody who, who was going to do it all from ladders to save the cost of scaffolding. So why would we? Why would we save money by uh, using slave labour? So you know, there's that whole procurement thing that we can go through. We can do it once, and we and we can sort it out rather than uh, individual groups having to do it on all individual sites. Obviously, the panels are more expensive. They tend to be more efficient and uh, have um, slower degradation. So there is a bit of a quid pro quo there, but it's still going to, um, it still does affect the bottom line to some extent. So what we're doing, what we're, what we're aiming to do is deliver good quality community owned rooftop solar without subsidy. The other thing that I would say is that when we had the feeding tariff and we had generous community benefit funds, I mean, I think Miranda mentioned a million pounds, uh, which is great. It's great. And all that money is going um, basically to fuel poverty and carbon reduction schemes, mm -hmm. which is even better. Absolutely amazing. That is, that is not going to happen anymore. You might get some community benefit from a, a community energy scheme, but it's certainly not guaranteed. And you would be advised to wait till later years of a project before dishing out money for community benefit. So, you know, if you've got your little town and they set up their own community benefit society, you've got to find a committee and a board, you've got to do your accounts and your AGM and all the rest of it. You manage to get some PV panels on a roof, which is great. You've then got to carry on managing that society for the next 20 or 25 years. And you're getting very little in terms of uh, community benefit funds out of the back of it. Wouldn't you be better off? Um, this is starting to sound like a sales pitch. Uh, again, you might be better off, let's put it that way, um, joining in a bigger society which has one board, one set of accounts, one AGM, and then the local volunteers can concentrate on doing what they what they do best, which is actually finding sites, making the contacts, you know, speaking to Gerald, who owns the fruit and veg business, because you know him because you play golf with him, or, or, um, or you're in his book group, or, or whatever. Um, so the thing about the big solar co-op is it still works in partnership with local groups. It's not a big centralised organisation with no local contact. Local groups and individuals are crucial to the process. Um, if we were just cold calling people, you know, from, from rural Shropshire and bringing up a factory in Leeds saying we want to come and put panels on your roof, it wouldn't work. It doesn't work. We've only, I do know one person who's had success in cold calling, and that is my colleague Richard, who's been working on the Matlock scheme, who <laughs> seems to have done it very well. But generally, it's a very difficult thing to do. So having those local contacts uh, is, is really important. <coughs> we also use volunteers, we train up volunteers to do the, the actual design process. And if they find out the electricity usage data for the site, they can take it through to having a proposal to, to pass on to the uh, building owner or occupier. Um, and then, so local volunteers can do what they do best without having to without being burned with running their own small community benefit society. I would say that Big Solar is set up very differently to most other community energy schemes. Most community energy schemes now are community benefit societies, whereby basically if you buy shares in the society, you become a member. Um, and the thing with the community benefit society is that the the benefits of the society have to go to the community, they can't go to the members. So you pay interest on their investment, but you're not giving a dividend as such. So 
you know, if you do have a really brilliant year, you can't suddenly say, oh, we're going to pay you 8% this year, any surplus has got to go through. So that's why that it's, it, it's normally it's the easiest way of raising funds for a shelf. We've set Big Soda Co-op as a, as a formal cooperative, and that means that the volunteers can become members of the cooperative. You don't have to invest. So if we have somebody like who's like a student who's doing a lot of work on doing designs for us, they can become a member of the society even if they don't have money to invest in it. Uh, and the first two, we're, it's now registered as a co-op. Um, I think, don't think we've got a bank account yet. That's always the, the much more difficult step than you would imagine. Um, but uh, the first two big solar sites are, are very nearly ready to go. And we're expecting to share off uh, um, later this summer or in the autumn. Any questions? Any really quick questions for Dave? If not, then we can take them together. The ultimate I forget the figures that were in the funding bit. Um, I mean, at the moment, I'd say it's been incubated by Sharon. So we've had funding, big soda cops had funding from people like Esme Fairburn and, and people like that. There is a there is a figure in there. Um, I think it's five megawatts within the first four or five years, something like that. But the more, the more, the more, the better. Okay. And the kind of deals that you have to do, say for Matlock, where you've got these different factories. Yes. You, you, you're getting them to sign up for at least for twenty years, and then they. Yes. Is that quite a long? I always think that that must be quite difficult for a business because. They don't know that they're going to get business, so they don't know they're going to sell the property and move on. So. Yes, any lease is dependent, obviously, on them staying on the site. Um, if they, if they, um, you know, if they sell the site, then um, then we have to either come to an arrangement with the new owners, mm. or um, um, or arrange to move the panels, basically, put them somewhere else. Um, one thing the big solar is offering is that uh, um, organisations can buy out the panels after five years if they want to. So, um, and that there's no punitive charge. You know, we're not going to say, oh, we're losing income. Therefore, um, which I think most sort of rent roof schemes would do, they would charge a punitive thing to um, we say, if, 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 you, if you've got confidence, once you see it's up and running and you know exactly what it's outputting, outputs are, if you want to buy it, that's fine. We will just charge you what it's what it's cost us minus what we've earned already, and then we will invest that money somewhere else and, and do that. So, so yes, yeah, so any lease has to, you know, there isn't a punitive thing if the building becomes unoccupied. That's a risk that's taken by by the co-op. Yeah, um, uh, I noticed you, you were saying about improving procurement and maintenance. Is big so is big solar looking to go beyond the Midlands or is that still very much the focus? No, no, it's so maintenance you, of this year. UK wide, UK we're wide. looking at already. Yes, we actually started off with looking at quite a few schemes in Scotland because because that's where the interest is. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. obviously the further north you go, the, the lower the output is, yeah. and therefore you know your income is, <clears throat> is constrained. Okay. Um Yes, the, um, what I haven't said is what we've, we've got a very small central team in the big solar co-op. We, what we've done recently is we've taken on three local coordinators. So there's one in Birmingham, there's one in Shropshire and there's one in Stroud. So the idea is we will really be pushing it. We will have somebody who's paid two or three days a week in each of those areas to really push it in those areas. So that they, they're the areas that we expect to move forward rapidly in the next year or two. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that we're, we've, we've dropped interest in other places. It's just that we, we haven't got so much support to give to, to other places. Okay, we'll find time for one yeah. final question. Um, go to the Matlock uh, uh, project. You've, been up, you've upped the number of roofs to 10, ten did you say? Yes. Have you, have you got some kind of implementation? schedule for the, putting those in and it's, the real question is about 
talking to Western Power about allowing that to happen? Is there any kind of forward look with Western Power? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, we 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 have um, we have open discussions with Western Power just to check there isn't any issue with any of these roofs. I think I think the situation at the moment is that they seem to be okay. The path is clear. The path seems to be clear. Um, um, but my colleague's dealing with that. Um, he's on holiday this week, which is why I'm doing this this pitch instead of him. Um, uh, yeah. So so we have been That's checking it. with with Western Power as to the. As to the timeline, that's that's really up to Derbyshire Dales. You know, we're the we're the consultants, we're the advisors. Um, in in a sense, if you if they can get all ten done at once, one chair offer, then then why not go for it? You know, and and if you can then be offering 10, 10 roofs to an installer to to do within you know two month period or something, that would be brilliant. But there might be reasons why. One or two of them are delayed. You know, might need might need planning permission, or they might need the, the company might not be quite ready to go with it. They're you know they're not sure they're going to check with headquarters or they're going to check with the landlord or you know. So ideally, um, get get you know ten or twelve roofs together, do them within within one share offer and and do it. The other, I mean, the <clears throat> one thing I've Normally, share offers are very specific. So, Convalton Hydro, we're building a hydro scheme. There was a share offer. This is what we want to do. This is the exact business case. But like, if you go to Bristol Community Energy, they said we want to do a hydro scheme. But actually, we're not 100% certain the hydro scheme is going to come together at this point. So, this is our basic plan, business plan for the hydro. Uh, if that doesn't happen, we're, well, we're, we've got a plan B in place. So we will then spend it on, we will then spend it on more rooftop solar. Do that. So you can have that sort of flexibility in there. So Derbyshire Dales could do a, a, a share offer that says we're definitely doing one, two and three. And, uh, but we're going to raise enough money to do 10 roofs. And we think those are going to be four, five, six, seven, et cetera. But they might turn out to be other roofs and then do a business case around that. Great. Thanks, Dave. And um, if there's any more questions for Dave, I'll be around for lunch yeah, then. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm sure you can yeah, come around there or get, get, get in touch with <laughs> um, But yeah, thank you. Thank okay. you very much for that, Dave. Great. So now we've reached our final presentation of the day before everyone gets fed, excitingly. Um, so Mark from WPD is going to pick up on some of the great issues that have come up today and, and be able to answer some of the questions people have had. Uh, so yeah, over to you, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, hello all, I'm Mark Mears from Western Power Distribution, uh, currently a Green Recovery Project Manager, but I will, will be running through some of the network reinforcement and our, our business plan, which uh, hopefully will be implemented April next year. We don't know the decision on that yet, but it, we're due to have it then this month. So fingers crossed, we'll have some more news after this month. Um, you can see from a couple of these slides, it's, gonna, it's, it's quite heavily... Um, pictures and, and figures related. So we'll go through them quite quickly, but it's just to give you a picture of the demand scenarios that, that we're predicting to have um, up towards 2050. So you can see in, in, in terawatts there that 2020, we're down around the 300 figure, but in 2050, we're imagining a massive peak in, in our power consumption. So you can also see on the right hand side there, it shows a lot of generation which will have a mix of, of technology types. So we're hoping that the, the line of, of import from generation sites would be would relatively the same, but a lot of uh, a lot of generation which would help us out. So uh, what we're planning to do in uh, our next business plan is to double the reinforcement expenditure. So um, Paul mentioned earlier that if we're not, not spending a certain amount of money every week, we're not going to catch up. We're not going to be able to to meet the targets. Um, so you can see the average on the top, which is a re reedy one is our current business plan, which takes us up to April next year. re reedy two takes us from April next year to 2028. So you can see that we're, we're planning to reinforce the network quite considerably. And in 2020, you can see the amount of car chargers that we're proposing to connect up to 2028, and also the heat pumps. 
So they are the, they are sort of the biggest things coming through for us at the moment. So we have a, a, a DFES uh, strategy, which is uh, distribution of future energy, energy scenarios. And this is basically showing you how we come up with that strategy. So first of all, we get a baseline. Uh, so we look at what our network is doing now and what we've got installed on our network. Then we look at proposed sites. So we look at the forecast based on accepted offers that we've got and any, any offers that we've got in, in process. And we contact local developers in the areas where we think development's going to happen. Then we engage with our stakeholders. So we ask them, what are you planning to do? We got um, local authorities and, and everybody else involved, and then we'll try and plan around that. And then we've got our projections for our scenarios. So it's looking at how we can improve our network, um, looking at medium and long term in our business plan. So all of the DFES information, um, there's documents available. Mm -hmm. So Eddie works hard on the stakeholder stuff. So yeah, we've got stakeholder feedback summary reports, which are available. Um, all the links, as, as Kai said, you'll have the, the, the links and everything available once we've uh, sent everything out. Um, you've got data through the map hub. You've got the technology results and the assumptions. So you can see how we've based our, our report. Um, and, and all of the information is on there. Um, publications that will be coming soon. So it's the, the technology profiles and assumptions, and also the growths for our, our big substations and different substations, as I like to call them. <laughs> so in our business plan is something that we haven't done before. Um, what we normally do is ask for all the money up front to reinforce our network. But with so much uncertainty coming up in the next next eight years, possibly, but well, and longer, um, we really don't know how much money we're going to need. So what we've done in the business plan is we've actually built a mechanism where we've gone with our best view. So you can see in the purple box is our best view, and then in our strategy we've said it could be up to this amount, or it could be below this amount. So we've actually accounted for in our business plan to spend up to this value here. So based on how we're progressing with the connections and our reinforcement strategy, we can amend that amount. So we're never going to cap it at what we think our best view is. So of the green recovery, so that's, that's a little bit about network reinforcement and where we're going with regards to ED2. Um, green recovery is a separate project. So we're investing 60 million pounds over our entire network in the next two years, which uh, slides quite old. So uh, it's up till April next year. So it's a lot of work to do in a short space of time. Um, what we're trying to do is we're enabling more green developments. So heat pumps, EV charges, uh, generation to connect to our network. So we've identified areas uh, with a lot of interest in low carbon technology projects and where network restrictions exist currently. And we've done extensive engagement via a call for evidence uh, back in 2021. We received over 200 um, responses, which was great. And what we've done then was be able to prioritize what we were going to do and how we were going to spend that money. So we're hoping that the investment, well, we know that the investment will unlock additional capacity in the areas that we've, we've um, identified and then additional capacity is created and it'll be available to any customer. So it's not shoehorned into who we buy call for evidence from. If you can identify a location where you think you can benefit from it, then you can apply and we, it's available to everybody. What's the different colored bubbles? They're the size of the project. So there's actually an interactive map you'll see in a couple of slides later where um, you can click on it. And literally as you hover over these, these bubbles, it will show you what they are, you can click on it, and then it'll tell you a little bit more about the project. So how do we make our decisions? So what we've done was we had three main criteria that we, we decided we had to meet. So it's the deliverability. So how quickly can we complete the infrastructure? Um, because it's such a short deadline and a, such a, a, a quick turnaround, we needed to make sure that we were able to deliver this project quickly. It's the utilization. So any network constraint exists at the moment. 
Um, how much is there of a need for this? And how much do we think the uptake would be? So we don't want to just reinforce the network in areas where we don't think there's going to be an uptake. So that was another crucial criteria from the call for evidence. And then obviously value for money. So if we can do something, it might cost a little bit more, but if that we get a lot more interest and a lot more benefit from the network, then we've looked at that as well. And the schemes include network extensions uh, to motorway service areas, because we understand that they're going to be in the, in the crucial locations um, for the rollout of EV chargers. Uh, there's primary and our BSP substations. There's um, anything from 33 to 132 thousand volts um, reinforcement. And it goes down to the local stuff as well. So there's 11,000 volt and H3LV substations, little distribution substations in, involved in it as well. There's a wide range of work going on across WPD's network. How much of the, what proportion of the problems are at the capacity of the substation? It can vary from area to area. So you can't really put a figure on it. Some areas are worse than others due to historic trends in cable types and things like that. But a lot of rural places we have issues with, purely because of the network type. In the past, you've had low demands in rural areas. So you'd have one farmhouse running very little, whereas now it's trying to connect generation, heat pumps and, and, and the like. So our overhead lines are not able to cope with it. But then also, the cumulative effect of our substations, our bigger substations, more and more connections, it just can't cope. So that's why we're reinforcing it. Is, is, sorry, is vehicle to grid part of the, your considerations? Not on green recovery. Green recovery is just reinforcement based on the three key criteria <laughs> and call for evidence we've had. Can I just take it the substations? Just because in the, the metals we were told at one point, uh, you don't put installing too many solar roofs because the substations just aren't going to be able to cope. Uh, and so you had community enthusiasts who were picking this up and really running with stuff. But uh, the power uh, company's energy generator was saying, oh, no, you, the, the, your substations won't cope. Is, have you overcome the problem of constrained urban substations as well? This, this, things in process at the moment, um, innovative ways, which Paul is involved with, of trying to get more capacity in urban areas. Um, there's also other schemes. So I mentioned in, uh, around the group discussion earlier, export limitation schemes, which are available. So on a, on a property, if the demand isn't there to use the power on the roof, then you can limit the amount of export on that solar panel. So you still have the maximum amount, yet you can limit it coming to our network. But that is obviously on a case-by-case -case basis with the, with the local planner, the way they, they plan the system. And not doing anything though on storage? Battery storage? Yeah. Um, we haven't, we've got single domestic premises. Um, we have a process in place to manage those. Um, but I'm not aware of anything on a massive scale that we, we we have an issue with them, or if in fact we're even thinking about having an issue with them, if that makes any sense. Because normally you would use it all on that side. The idea of the storage would be to build a battery, use it for the house, energy bills produce, so it doesn't become so much of a problem for us. As you move through from 2025, 2030, 2040, and like your vehicle to grid, is there a case for smartening the grid up so that it can balance itself, so you can save or you could switch your freezer off, for example, for a couple of hours to smartly it up? So it's home to grid, grid to home. Yeah. So it's like communicating somehow. Yeah. So that's exactly what the battery storage is. So you've got a solar panel, you've got a battery. Um, you've also got our supply, but your house could potentially run itself. So the, the smart... Well, there's, a, there's, a, there's a little signal that comes from you guys, so when you shit. <laughs> switch something off. Yeah, switches so, it off automatically. So we have got for the bigger sites, the active network management. 
So we're able to turn around and say, okay, we're having trouble at the moment, you're not allowed to export, or we need you to reduce the demand. There's a lot going on at the moment regarding flexible connections. So we are turning around and being able to say, at times of certain demand, at the moment we can't connect you because of X, Y, and Z, but we can give you a flexible connection, which says, if we have these problems, you now reduce. Just kind of a, a, a management system that we, we can offer. It's a big it's a massive opportunity, surely. And that, and that sort of thing you're talking about does exist already with flexibility markets. So, you know, people in certain areas can sign up for those and get that signal to switch off. And oh, yeah. I was going to ask how, how much uh, dynamic pricing, how, how much is that to do with your strategy for anticipation of payments? That's sort of the answer question. Yeah. We, we, it's a managed demand. Flat, flat the peaks. Yes. Well, we we would we would encourage people to export under our network where we can because and, and vehicle vehicle the grid is also good. So we would encourage people to charge at night. Man goes up at night, which is not fantastic for us because it flattens our peak, but it then lowers the demand in the day, daytime. So, you know, through your energy plans and things, you can have cheaper tariffs at night, the same as the, the economy seven used to work, where you would keep your house at night and then store it in for the next day. So we, we can encourage systems, and but most of that is done with the energy supplier. Yeah. Whereas we don't deal with the energy supply market. We're just the distribution side. So, yeah. In terms of flattening peaks, it's quite important to you, isn't it? It is in one sense. In another sense, it's difficult. So we, without going into too much depth, no, no. we we look for um, what's called cyclic rating. So all of our cables have got a chance to recover from any peaks, which then it's, it's all about heat. So the more heat you have in a cable, the more it works. So if you flatten the peak and the peak is higher, and our cables are working harder, so the demand is hard to get around to everybody else. So there, there are problems with it, which we, we, are, we are looking into it. And of course, one more thing just to add. We are obviously changing the way we run our system. Um, so we obviously changing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry about this. <laughs> So when I said we are transitioning to become a distribution system operator, one of the incentives of that uh, system is to obviously be able to manage the our system or our network such that what we are doing is we are installing a lot of monitoring equipment, especially on the XB system, so that we exactly understand what is happening in the real time, and then being able to control the system that way by either sending a signal or or doing something about it, about the constraint when it occurs in real time. Yeah, Phil, your yeah, question. Yeah, can I just ask you a question about Ratcliffe Power Stations closing down in a few years' time? And I believe it has a network connection of capacity to two million homes. Since network connections are such an expensive for renewable energy, have you been approached by anyone about you know, what's going to happen to that connection? You're just going to throw it away. It, it seems claimable to me that that's not going to be used for renewable energy because of the site there between the station and the motorway, we've just done our calculations based on the area. It's just gravel pits, waste, I'm not going to call it wasteland, but low grade uh, agricultural land, uh, you could get a sort of an 80 megawatt um, solar farm on there. Um, all of this in the uh, boundary. Yeah, um, and, 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 use, and use that connection. To me, it's just it's crazy. Well, is there something wrong with the connection? Is it too old? Is it, is it, is it degraded? Is there something? If I'm entirely honest, I have no idea, because that's the transmission network. Oh. So that would be sort of national grids oh, sorry. remit. Okay. So we go from, from a bulk supply point, which we get from national grid, 
and they transmit at 132,000 volts. So, so your power stations from, from uh, are usually privately owned these days, um, and, and then it goes to National Grid then to transmit it across their network to us, and, and we go down to the lower levels. But, but yes, I, I don't know if anybody's thought of it, if anybody's applied. I would imagine somebody would have thought of it because the infrastructure is there. So it, it, it would be useful to know. Well, anyway, if, all, they're, all they're talking about is a, is a, a waste. Um, uh, energy from waste. Yeah. Isn't, isn't the issue that it's more expensive to connect to the network the higher up the, the steps of the network you get? It's relatively easy and cheap to, to connect in at 11 kb. But if you're, if you're up at the level of actually power station, you know, it's just too expensive to connect. The amount of infrastructure and land you need to connect to that sort of voltage level. Yes. It's enormous. Yes. Um, there's so many different license obligations. You're running as a power station at, at that size. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of a lot of legal <laughs> stuff you have to go through as well. So yeah, it, it becomes more difficult with the scale. It is also possible to assume that if that capacity becomes available, it will probably be gone by the time it's released. Yeah. Because there's a lot of applications right now waiting. So once that capacity is released, I'm sure yes. those that are written on the queue will be... Yeah, it, it, it might be soaked up straight away by the surrounding area and in existing but, connections. But um, Alan mentioned about putting you know, lots of domestic PV on. Now, if you're going in below four kilowatts, you, 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 you don't have to be consulted, do you? Correct. So, so if somebody wants eight. to put in a hundred four kilowatt domestic system, so they don't need to ask you at all. Whereas what? if, if this... somebody wanted to put in four hundred kilowatts, there's a couple of processes. So <laughs> the actual limit is three point six eight. Yes. So if you put in three point six eight, which equates to sixteen amps, then it's just not the fire and fit. Yes. Now, if there's multiple applications, it then becomes what's called a multiple application, which then is studied on our network. So we would study the network to make sure that it would work. And if it doesn't, then we would notify that, that we can't fit them until we tell you that you can fit them because we would need to reinforce the network. But we would reinforce the network for free, I believe. Yeah. You, you're correct. <laughs> so we, can't say, we can't say no, um, but what we can say, it's a multiple in one area. We need to know about it beforehand because that's going to have a substantial fault rise on our network, so we need to reinforce before you do that. What you might get is they'll say you can install 20 of them before we use reinforcement. We'll let you know when you can install more. So that it's like a prolonged approach. Yeah. And Miranda, did you have a question? Well, well, yeah, okay, yeah. All right. Fuck yeah. So this is a general overview of, of Green Recovery. It's a, it's a massive investment that WP is making. And in a short space of time, which which I've showed you before. So a couple of schemes in the in the East Midlands. Um, if you want any more information, then they, they'll all be on the Green Recovery website, and you'll be able to see everything in that area. But these are the smaller ones. So you can see that there's there's a couple of like Derby, for example, replacing a long section of 11 kb cable that we have known to have issues with where we've had connections. There's been a high reinforcement cost. We've needed to replace this cable. So there's been a couple of cases where we've said, okay, we've known about it. Let's get on and do it. So now we're paying for it and we're going to go and do it. <clears throat> a couple of larger schemes. So uh, Sleaford T is seven kilometers of 132 um, overhead line that we're going to replace and reprofile to 75 degrees, which makes us, which enables us then to connect more, more load. Um, tip shelf. So um, we're in two 33 cables out towards tip shelf motorway <coughs> service area, which will help them with a the connection that's had massive, um, massive applications from. But also we're replacing the two one three two transformers at Alfreton. That's quite a large scheme on its own, um, and that that'll increase capacity for, for everybody in the area. Um, Eastcroft prim Primary, which is Nottingham City Centre. We're aware of a problem down in the south of the centre, and obviously, with as, as we mentioned earlier, Nottingham's 
um, trying to become net zero by 2025. So this would massively help. So we're installing a new primary substation um, somewhere in Nottingham. <laughs> uh, not to find the primary substation site. Um, but we're, we're, in, we're in active discussion with not, Nottingham City Council at the moment, trying to find a parcel of land where we can, where we can plant this thing. Um, and once that's installed, it'll release loads of capacity in the area, which is really good. So that's, uh, that's my presentation. So now I'll open the floor to any question. In that last scenario, um, in terms of strengthening, where within the current energy system does the question of storage, battery storage, reside? Is it with groups like the UPD? Or is it with the generators? Or is it with community energy projects? What, so that notion about storage to moderate and modulate, where does that fit? Does it come within your remit? So not? We, we have private developers, community energy groups that come to us and say, we want to connect this battery at this scale onto your network. So we would make sure that that would work. And they are owned and operated by private entities. Now, with flexibility connections, and a lot of rules that are going to change in the future, then what we will do is we will say, okay, we are struggling with demand. We will pay you to switch it on or export your power into our network, which will then allow us to have more flexibility over it rather than reinforcing everything all the time. So that's where it comes in for us. We wouldn't own, operate, and maintain battery systems ourselves but we would treat it as an import and export capacity on our network, owned and operated by a private developer or customer or whoever it might be. Or a community call. Or a community, yeah. And that will that change if you become a DSO? No, it'd be encouraged as a DSO because then we're, we're trying to supply the network in a, in a different way. So as a network operator, We've only ever thought about electricity flowing in one direction, as Faithful alluded to in his first slide. Yeah. We're going from A to B, people got electricity, that's fine. But now we're moving with the times, becoming a DSO, which is becoming flexible in our, in our operation across the entire network. Okay, any other questions for Mark or any of the other EPD guys? Uh, yeah, yeah tell me. The, the, other, the other organization like yours, and sit alongside you. Is there any coordination as you're going forward? Which one? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Which one? There's a pen and paper. <laughs> yeah, they, they have they have forums and they, there's working groups. There's a lot of um, information that at the moment everybody's quite focused on what's going to happen in April um, with with this this code review. So it, it, it's heavily focused on that at the moment, which is a massive change for the industry, to be honest. And there's the Energy Networks Association, so all the DNOs are members of, so they all work together on, on things like that. Mm -hmm. um, Jackie? Um, my group wanted to know, have you got contracts for working in partnership with micro electricity networks? Um, I don't know. Is the honest answer? Right, <laughs> <laughs> Who should I talk to in that case? In the future. Hey, yeah. And <laughs> um, do you cover the swapping fire? I have no idea where that Cambridge, is. Yeah. Kate, the Cambridge say so don't, do you? No, no. No, that's the you can find it. Yeah. Yeah. You can yeah. Uh, any any final questions for if not, I'm sure you can pick up some of those, those conversations over lunch. Uh, but yeah, no, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, yeah, we have we've reached the end of our, of our session today. Finally, time for lunch. You'll all be pleased to know. Um, you'll have seen that George has just dropped the feedback form on, um, on all the tables. So, if you could please just fill that out for us. As I mentioned, we, we do tailor these sessions. Um, going forward, you know, we'll be, be delivering more and more of these online and in person. So if you can let us know what you want to hear about, who you want to hear from, topics you want to you want to discuss, 
And yeah, that you know how we found today's session that that's really valuable for us in terms of how we design these these sessions um, and sort the support that they come and all the people we give to you. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd just like to everyone to join in in thanking all of our speakers. So Miranda, Faithful, Shannon, Dave, and, and Mark. Uh, great to hear from all of them covering sort of real range of, of topics. Great to hear about the the community energy work that's, that's going on by Share Energy, Big Solar Corp, and Nottingham Energy Partnership locally doing really inspiring projects. Great to hear about, about the work and the community energy and Lynn's doing. So definitely do get, get involved in that. And we'll be sending out links to all the resources that we discussed today, including the state of the sector report um, and other bits. So yeah, and then it's just thanks, thanks to all of you for, for coming along today. I hope you found the session useful. Um, I know there's there's you know been a lot of discussion how WPP can work with community groups, how we can help just shed some light on that and being able to make the comments uh, if he wants to and, and got, some, got some of the answers that he, he wants to do as well. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks very much. And so lunch is just in the kitchen there, so if everyone can just make an orderly queue. Um, they're all vegan, I believe, so anyone who's got dietary is like that, then they're all, they're all the same, everyone's got a box to themselves. Um, so yeah, do, do stick around in this room, um, sort of, yeah, have, have lunch in here, and then some point you think we're going to go and enjoy the sunshine this afternoon, I'm, I'm sure. And one last thing, when you leave in, do leave, take your name badge off and leave it on that table um, at the front as well. So, yeah.